The Australian Investors Podcast is brought to you by BetaShares, serving over 1 million investors across Australia's broadest range of ETFs. After years of record low interest rates, income-seeking investors have been returning to cash and fixed income ETFs, drawn by the attractive returns on offer. Equity income funds have also been generating healthy income streams. BetaShares provides yield-hungry investors with a range of income-focused funds to choose from, including ETFs offering exposure to cash, bonds, hybrids, Australian shares, and international shares. To explore the BetaShares ETF range, visit betashares.com.au and consider if the fund is right for you. I'm also proud to say that this episode of the Australian Investors Podcast is brought to you by The Intelligent Investor, Australia's premier investment research membership service. You can get a free trial for 15 days, no credit card details required. To access the insights of some of Australia's best analysts, including buy, hold, and sell share recommendations, click the link in your podcast player to secure your Intelligent Investor membership today. This Australian Investors Podcast episode is brought to you by The Intelligent Investor, Australia's premier investment research membership service. You can get a free trial for 15 days, no credit card details required. To access the insights of some of Australia's best analysts, use the coupon code RASK and secure your Intelligent Investor membership today. We're proud to have the Intelligent Investor as an ongoing supporter of the Australian Investors podcast. As a result, RASK does not earn a volume-based fee. Simply head to intelligentinvestor.com.au or use the link in your podcast player to access your free trial. This episode of the Australian Investors Podcast is also proudly supported by SelfWealth, Australia's leading independent broker. Over 120,000 investors trust SelfWealth with over $9 billion in equities. With SelfWealth, you can trade ASX, US, and Hong Kong listed shares for a flat fee. On a $10,000 investment with Comsec, you'd pay $29.95 in fees. Yet with SelfWealth, it's just $9.50. The thing I like about SelfWealth is the full access to fundamental company data and how easy it is to trade US, Hong Kong, and Aussie shares in one place. You can see your Apple shares and ACDC ETF right beside each other. To join SelfWealth now, use the link in your podcast player or head to selfwealth.com.au and use the coupon code RASK during sign-up. Thanks for tuning in to today's podcast. Please remember that all of the information in this podcast episode is limited to general information only. That means the information is not specific to you, your needs, goals, or objectives. So you should seek the advice of a licensed and trusted financial professional before acting on the information. And before you acquire or apply for a financial product, please read the PDS or product disclosure statement, which should be available on the issuer's website. Lastly, please keep in mind that past performance is not indicative of future performance. Peter Pan is the Portfolio Manager of Castlereagh Equity. Many Australian investors already know Peter from his time blogging and due to his activity on Twitter. This podcast is epic, unfiltered, barely edited and raw. It took place remotely after a very brief conversation sparked my interest and I sent a series of short questions and talking points to Peter ahead of time. The audio file is a little rough, so consider wearing your headphones. You've probably seen this episode come up in your feed and noticed this podcast is also the longest I have ever recorded. My wife said I should break it up into two parts. However, if I did that, it would have meant the diehard investors and lifelong learners among you may have missed the deep signals that Peter covers during the next two and a half hours of recording. In this conversation, Peter covers everything from card counting and probability, mental models for analyzing management teams or yourself, valuations and modeling outcomes, including examples of United Overseas Australia, which is listed on the ASX under the ticker code UOS, and Data3 Limited under the ticker code DTL. In the first 60 minutes, Peter sets the groundwork for the entire conversation. However, if you're most interested in how he actually invests, and the models he applies to his investing, jump forward to around 60 minutes into the conversation. At the very end of the recording, around two hours and 26 minutes in, Peter answers three questions that I sent him ahead of time, including, is it okay for non-investors to follow the efficient market hypothesis, EMH, and invest passively? Does an investment committee ever work? 
And does a fund manager need business experience? His answers are fascinating, especially the final one. I hope you stick around for the full discussion. And as always, I hope you enjoy this conversation with Peter Pan of Castle Ray Equity. Peter, thanks for taking some time out to join me and listeners for a conversation about your story and investing today. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you all for inviting me. We have spoke last month or about a month ago, and this was the first, that was the first uh, engagement you and I had had. We've spoken on Twitter, I think, maybe once or twice over the years. And this conversation comes as a result of speaking with other people who follow you or maybe um, invest with you or, or follow your, your letters. I, I was doing some digging and you just spoke to me off there just a moment ago and you said you haven't done too many of these interviews. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful that you've decided to come on the show, but also um, to be able to talk a bit more about your backstory and how you got started in investing because I don't think that's been told before. So maybe just to kick things off, can you just kind of relive the, 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 the early days for you, Peter, and how you got started in investing um, I know that's a lot to take in, but if you could just walk us through your journey uh, before starting Castle Ray, right up maybe even your first investment, how that went, how that came about. There's so much to unpack there as we go along. My story in a nutshell is a Rex to riches, well, not really riches, but Rex to where I am <laughs> now, uh, through a combination of really, really good fortune and uh, a little bit of hard work on my part. So, okay, I, I, I basically grew up in a village in a fishing village in Malaysia, think we were real poor. I mean, it was it was it was it, it, it was it was poor. Uh, it was a poor environment. There was limited opportunities, uh, and the environment is such that the only way for me to progress is basically via education. That that was the only option available at that time. I don't have a family background in business. I don't have family support and things like that. Everyone is poor. I progressed from high school to, from primary school to high school to university via a series of scholarships and grants uh, given by governments, and these grants were awarded on the basis of academic merit. Um, and for that, I have to thank the governments of both Singapore and Malaysia for providing me the educational opportunities that would uh, that that would bring me to where I am today. So, uh, in an abstract sense, my early life was spent. In perfecting the skill of hacking curriculum, educational <laughs> curriculums, to the exclusion of everything else, right? That was my main focus. Um, I just needed to hack the curriculum to get the best uh, uh, results that uh, the the decision makers want to see, which is a hundred percent in every single subjects and A plus and you know what not. And obviously, this was born of absolute necessity. So you know, it's do or die. Um, you don't get a marks, you don't get a money, you don't get a scholarship, and your education ends. So um, that that was one hurdle after another. It was a series of three or four grants that are uh, that are not dependent upon one another. One grant runs out, you gotta you gotta fight for another one, then you gotta fight for another one. And I have competitors. I have very very smart cohorts. <laughs> we are all aiming for the same thing. Um, so I got lucky in a sense. Um, okay. This hacking skill, curriculum hacking skill, quickly became redundant the moment I graduated. <laughs> so for, uh, for 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 the younger folks, do be aware that you know there's a shelf life for your hacking skill. Uh, How did you hack hack the curriculum, Peter? What, what, what tricks would you use? I can't remember the exact details, but basically, just doing your work, being fluent in exactly what you need to do, knowing. Anticipating what sort of exam, uh, what sort of typical questions will be asked of you, ex- basically anticipating what your professors or your teachers will need, and just and just and just nailing it. Basically, that 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 that's all there is to it. Just nailing it. I mean, when when you study, you can't cover everything, so you got to pick and choose what you want to concentrate, what you will concentrate on, and uh, to you have a rough idea, but you can never be sure. Right, so sometimes you nail it. Right, every single thing that you have studied for that you can memorize in your sleep just came, just comes out in the exam papers, and you can just write it like a zombie. You can just write the whole thing out, and what's done, right? <laughs> uh, sometimes you get unlucky. They will ask you like oddball questions, and you need to sit there and think, and you'll be wasting time, and you won't do so well. 
but the difference is minor. Once you've done your work, the difference is between an A plus or A minus, you know, a hundred or ninety nine. So you know, uh, even 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 with errors, that the hacking allows me to be in the top, uh, 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 in the top percentile. And obviously, all the work is cumulative. So you do your work at the start, you 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 will have a better probability going into the future, and you know it follows in sequence. So this is again something to bear in mind for those who believe in the efficient market hypothesis. So yeah, your 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 the the. Uh, or even or even uh, theories of creation where they say that there's a creator because it's just not probable that humans exist because um, you need to consider the idea of conditional probabilities. When you do something well at the start, chances are you keep doing something well going into the future and your probability of success keeps increasing with mm. compounding and cumulative knowledge. So that this is something that was in action for my life. So I don't believe in the EMH precisely because of my personal experience. Um, so, okay. Um, so again, like I said, the hacking skill was totally useless once I graduated. But the education was important in that it gave me the basic grounding in the hard sciences and maths, uh, which I am now utilizing to their full potential. You know, 20, well, I don't know, 20, 20 years after I graduated, I'm now beginning to use my high school knowledge and you know, university, a bit of university knowledge. Um, so in my fin- talking about university, in my final year of university, I got introduced to card counting and blackjack uh, by a group of friends. So we just started a caper, just card counting, card, card counting at the Crown Casino in Melbourne. Um, and that, that introduced me to ideas of probabilities and win rates and expected returns. So it was an application of statistical statistical maths. I hate mm. the statistical maths, but it turns out that is that is going to be the most useful <laughs> going forward. <laughs> um, so obviously, like um, if you have that, we, we, I did the maths and basically I I came out with the maths and go like, well, I'm earning about ten dollars per hour because my the amount of capital that I have to deploy was too low. Uh, so it wasn't really worthwhile. I could make more money being a bartender, and mm. um, I didn't relish a life being a professional gambler. Given that I was going to graduate to be a lawyer after all, so I stopped and uh, I finished my studies and I became a lawyer. Um, so you were doing that. So you were doing card counting um, at the well, casino when you were at uni at the Crown Casino. Yeah, right. So and the, the Crown Casino is just open at that time, and they were giving you free parking and virtually your expenses are virtually nothing you you drive there you park it's free parking and you play and you become a member of the club and give you points so the points can be redeemed for meals and drinks and even 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 a hotel stay so basically like you know they were footing your expenses um would you you would they would they know what you were doing pardon would they know what you were doing uh yes sometimes yes because uh, we were amateurs and we didn't quite get so professional that we will get into the art of disguise because like, you need mm. to disguise your activities. But like mm. I say, any car counter will become pretty apparent for anyone who, who are really looking for them. Uh, and what happens is that the casino does not really care too much because there are good car counters and there are bad car counters. There are more bad car counters and good car counters. So the car counters... The phenomenon of card counters actually increased the popularity of blackjack because everyone thought that there could be a good card counter and the casino was just beating them. So they don't, <laughs> they, they, they don't really do it, but sometimes they, they, they put the gates down when they, when they realize that you are going too far. Um, a telltale sign is basically your bets. A normal punter basically bets like you know, 20 bucks, 25 bucks, 25 bucks, 25 bucks, 50 bucks, maybe sometimes 25 bucks, 50 bucks. The bet sizes don't really change for an amateur punter. Mm. But for a professional card counter, the bet sizes, the, the bigger that you vary your bet sizes, the bigger your age is. The idea is that when, you're, when your counting shows that you have an age, you, you bet as much as you can because that's when you, you're not always going to win, but on balance, you're going to win more than you lose and you want to win big when you win. Mm. And uh, that, that, that occurs maybe five, one to five percent of the time the other 95 percent of the time you're just grinding you're, you're losing so you want to bet the minimum size possible or not bet so a card mm-hmm. counter will exhibit a big variation in bet sizes 
from five dollars to a minimum of five dollars or not betting to a maximum table maximum and that's a big mm -hmm. tell and the art of these guys is to sort of scale it down and scale it up to make it look like it's normal behavior but you know that's what the professionals do there are other mm -hmm. methods too there are plenty of books about that so mm -hmm. yeah. fascinating so so what did you do after you graduated with a law well, degree. Just before I graduated, the same mob that introduced me to Tai Kang thing, they are a bit mad about money. So basically they introduced me to Buffett and Lynch. So basically like Buffett's Buffett's books and uh, Peter Lynch's books were my foundational starting point uh into the uh, into the idea of stock market investing. And uh so I started my investing journey in late nineteen ninety six. I save I, I started work, I saved up some money and I had uh i have some more money and i bought my first share in commonwealth bank and uh and telstra in 1997 those are my first shares uh, commonwealth bank was bought at ten dollars it was yielding a dollar of dividend per annum and it was mm, there was franking on top of that so it was a good market to buy in 1996 it was uh just before the start of the tech boom telstra mm -hmm. i bought at three dollars and i eventually sold it for 950. um <laughs> But all of that was just luck. I saw, I mean, I didn't know what I was doing. I experienced the boom and bust of the technology bubble. Uh, in the late 90s, I bought stocks at a dollar and it went to a high of 12. I eventually offloaded everything at about eight. But I had losses along the way too. I, I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, overall, the whole experience was, was that I ended up slightly break even though I made a little bit uh, when, 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 when the crash came along. Um, no, there were big mistakes. The big mistake was of the obviously CBA. I mean, I had ten thousand dollars. I invested five uh ten thousand in CBA hmm. in nineteen ninety six at ten dollars per share. I sold it a year later at thirteen bucks a share after getting a dividend. So I made four bucks out of it, like per share. So I made forty percent from the share from CBA hmm. shares in a period of less than a year, and I thought I was a bloody genius. <laughs> uh if I've held CBA up until now, that position would have been worth at least 10, 15, 20 times. You know, I'm too dispirited to actually look at it, but that 10,000 shares, I had 10,000 shares. Oh no, I had 1,000 shares bought bought for $10 per share at uh, $10,000 in total. So you, you can basically do the, do the maths <laughs> from 1996 <laughs> until now, how much I've actually lost by selling it, you know, by selling at 40%. So yeah, um, then, after that, I uh, the, that five years during the boom and during that period until the end of the until the early uh two thousands um was spent basically exploring. So I was looking at other matters such as uh, technical analysis, charting, quantitative analysis, candlesticks, you know, whatever, whatever methods there were under the sun, I had a look at, and basically yeah, uh. It, none of them really worked so it was just a matter of elimination and i just ended up with uh investing as i call it you know what what, what the market calls value investing but, you know, we, we just call it investing and uh, since basically since i settled on this method um i think right after the gfc since i started on this method which is like 23 years ago the whole time since then has been spent on continuous learning so i've been learning and learning and learning every year and i'm still learning up to now so that 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 is where i mean in a nutshell that is that was my development and then so i mean i i was going to ask you about uh whether you use technical analysis and whether that worked for you because of the card counting and the quantitative background um okay do you think you were more susceptible to the allure of trading because of your background for sure, you know you want you curriculum hacking, educational curriculum hacking. You get your feedback pretty much straight away, right? You mm. you you put in the effort, you get your exam paper, you do your you you you, you do it. A couple of days later, you have feedback, all right? Whether you fuck up or whether you you did really well. So the feedback was there to reinforce your behavior and short term feedbacks really really quick pop 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 pop, pop right? Uh, and not only do you get feedback in one subject, you get feedbacks in like 10 subjects or whatever, how, how many subjects you're taking. So you're continuously getting feedback in a tangible manner. All right. And uh, that 
That is a feature of a common person's life. They get a lot of feedback. They want a lot of feedback so that they know how they are progressing. Uh, it's not the same in the investing world. You don't get feedback that quickly. And you're correct. There was an allure to short-term trading because my mind was autom automatically set to the idea that there's a feedback mechanism and I can gauge how well I'm doing and it's all tangible and I can control it. Uh, there's all these illusions. I told you I didn't know what I was doing. Mm. So the first problem with charting was that statistically, there was no basis for it. The seminal book for it is Maggie and Edwards. Uh, uh, technical, technical trading or something. I think it's a book that's published in 1960s. The first assumption was already something that I disagree with. So the first assumption in charting is that the price encapsulates all information. You don't need to know anything else. That's what it is. I don't agree with that. So even the foundation is already weak. But even if I assume that that's correct, all right, let's go. There are, there are patterns in charts that people look for, heads and shoulders, you know, a double bottom, uh, a breakout from channel, breakout from bands, RSI, RSA. The problem is somebody tried doing a statistical analysis on it. Number one, how do you define for a computer what is a head and shoulder? What is hmm. a double bottom, right? It's very, very difficult to define all those things. It's visual. So, okay, somebody tried to do it. The problem was that the sample size that they came up with was never convincing. So it says, oh, this pattern, chances are, uh, it conti this pattern is a continuation pattern for 60% of the time, meaning that the direction will continue in the same direction as before. Or this, this pattern will indicate a reversal, uh, a, 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 re a price reversal. X number of the time, right? 70%, 60%, there's a percentage that's given. The problem is that then you look at the sample, how many samples were analyzed, and sometimes the samples are as low as five, sometimes it's 20, sometimes mm. the most I saw was 70, and this was over a period of 20 years of analyzing the US stock market. I can give you the name of the book later on, but it's not really relevant for our purposes. So there's no statistical basis for it. Mm. So if there's no hard data for it, then you need to obviously try to reason it from the ground up and you know the proponents basically say that well it encapsulates all of them all the pertinence players emotions and whatever they have for breakfast or whatever it's all in the price it's all in the action right and uh to a certain extent it becomes a positive feedback because that uh, you know you expect it to happen everyone expects it to happen and it happens so i don't know right i'm not convinced i'm not convinced that it works for me. A lot of people profess that it works for them. But mm -hmm. like I said, to me, it doesn't work. Uh, Buffett and Edward Top say the same thing. That, that Buffett basically studied technical analysis. He said so a couple of times. People just don't quote him that often. When he was young, before he started his partnership, he dabbled, He said he dabbled in something called technical analysis. That didn't work. Edward Top, he said he looked at technical analysis and basically he says it was useful in the negative in a sense that he said that I knew where not to look. That 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 was a data for him. <laughs> um I think it's important to keep an open mind because I am actually looking at revisiting all of these things again. And one of the recent things that I read is that a, a stock with good fundamentals usually exhibits good technicals. Hmm. Has right. to be in it. Think about it, it has to be the price search. You know, how RSI is calculated in terms of like how the price is jumping in terms of positive volatility, right? I mean, it's a shit stock. You'll be going the other way. It'll be negative volatility. There'll always be like cliffs, right? And whenever there's cliffs, the RSI goes through a roof on the negative side. So, um, but a good stock, a good fundamental stock exhibits good TA. Not all the time, but maybe, maybe often enough for it to make a difference. Mm. I don't know. It's still a work in progress. I don't know. So for that purpose, I wouldn't say that TA is totally useless. I think that it is useless. Uh, I think it's useful even to the extent that I know a lot of people believe in it. Mm. So yeah, that's yeah. TA. Uh, quantitative was easy. Quantitative, I was lousy with computers. So basically, I, I, I know that all my computer friends who are good in programming with fast connections and stuff like that. 
they're, they're going to have me for lunch with quantitative trading. So that was a quick no. I know I can do it, but I don't have the equipment and skills to do it. I'm not a good programmer. I don't know my way around computers. At that time, we were still using dial up, you know, do, 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 do. Remember? I don't know what remember, <laughs> but yeah. yeah I do remember that. People were using T1 connections. I was using do, 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 do. You're going to lose. Right? You're going to totally, totally lose. So it was, it was very quick. There might be a way out there, but I know that I'm going to be a passer at a, at a poker table. I'm just going to lose that game so badly. Mm. So, yeah. So, so, so then, Peter, that's fascinating in itself. Um, but take, take us through the establishment or the, the, the origin story for Castle Ray, because my understanding is you're a full-time practicing lawyer and the investing is the thing that you do maybe the five to nine okay. or on weekends. Is that, is that right? Uh, not now. Now is now it's the other way around. I mean, I spend probably 5% of my time. My working hours are long. I would say my working hours is 7.24 in terms of investing, <laughs> other than when I'm sleeping. But even when I'm sleeping, I'm probably dreaming about valuations and stocks. <laughs> Not really healthy, but that's the way it is. Uh, and uh, the legal part takes me like 5% of my time. So it, it's the other way around. But yes, I was a practicing okay. lawyer for a long time. Uh, so that was why I studied in uni. And uh, that was a different story by itself why I went into law. But uh, it was born out of necessity. Um, mm. So I did I did the law, I did my deals, I did my time. And basically, I ended up hating the law. I, I, I absolutely hated it. The, the, the law, I don't like the industry. Because I know the industry is essential to a functioning society, but I don't like the industry because it encourages really, really shitty behavior in the participants. I, I, I'm not that good that I can escape my environment. If I'm in an environment where everyone behaves badly, I'll be behaving badly eventually. And um, I, I just don't want to be part of that. I can make my money in the law easily. I was managing partner in a law firm. We were this close to bringing our law firm to a listing. And, hmm. But it was it just didn't work for me. It works for other people. It doesn't work for me. Um, Castle Ray Equity, I've always wanted to invest I've always wanted, I always liked investing since I graduated from university. But it was never the right time to start something. So, you know, a business has to start only when the conditions allows it to start. And uh, it was never possible before, before, before 2007, 2008. It wasn't possible for, some, for something like Castle Equity to even exist. The time wasn't right for it. There was no SMSF. There was, there was, the, uh, uh, there was, uh, the the internet was, uh, was still taking its baby steps. Uh, there was no blogosphere. There was no social media. There was nothing basically. So if you want to start, how are you going to start, right? Mm. You, you can't even get yourself known by other people other than by direct physical contact, and it's just not the way. No one and no one's going to entrust money with you if you are just a thirty year old lawyer right <laughs> you know? mm. so okay Castle Castle equity started in the aftermath of the GFC and as usual with these events the way I look at it it was like Castle Ray equity came about due to a confluence of several several events coming together it's always like that Se mm -hmm. a confluence of several events um firstly I have spare capital after many years of saving and paying off the mortgage so I'm done. Like I have the money, spare money to invest now. Secondly, mm -hmm. I've garnered enough experience, both in the business world and investing, to actually have the confidence to incubate an investment company. Number three, I have the support right at that time of you no know, uh, uh, uh of my partner, the accountant, Mr. Chen, who started uh who 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 is now an accountant in Melbourne, but we started it together. Um fourthly, I had I, I started having I was I was managing my father in law's superannuation fund. Mm -hmm. And basically from managing that I, I there was just so much fee gouging. That was just mm -hmm. ridiculous. There was three, four layers of fees in a market that did sixteen percent in an all growth, all share portfolio. My father in law got eight percent. Mm -hmm. Eight a full eight percent went in fees. It was that that was ridiculous, right? No, 
uh, the platform was charging 1% just to be a platform and the money was allocated to a manager of managers who charge 1% and a manager manager allocated it to some other people who charge 1% and then they allocated it to somebody else that charge 1%. And basically, like, there was layers and layers and layers of fees. It was ridiculous. So basically, um, I thought that, look, you know, there, there, there must be a better deal for, for, mm. for your average mom and dad. You know, uh, mom and dad savers wanting to uh, save up for retirement. Okay, so so that was an innate sense of injustice that the industry is gouging off people. Uh, fifthly, I wanted to, Mr. Chen was my partner. At that time, he was on the cusp of starting his own accountancy firm and he was a bit unsure. It was a big step. And Castle Equity was my way of showing him that I say that in these sort of industries, all you need to do is not stuff up. Just do the right thing consistently all the time, right? And you don't just you don't even need to be a best. You just need to be slightly above average, but do the right thing all the time by your customer or clients, and your business will grow progressively in an exponential manner. One, two, four, eight, sixteen. And I say that uh, to prove it to you, I'm going to start incubating a com uh, investment company now, and it's going to grow from a capital of paid up capital of ten thousand dollars. It's going to grow to many many millions. Even in the first few years, so it was an encourage, ex encouraging, encouragement uh, 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 um, exercise, and also it was a backup. It was a it was a backup plan because we were investing our own monies. If everything goes pear shape and this goes well, we have something to fall back on, mm. right? If this goes pear shape and the other thing goes well, we have something to fall back on too. So, um, lastly. Yeah, lastly, obviously, I wanted an alternative. I wanted to get out of law really desperately. I just found it really, really distasteful. So that was personal motivation there. So you can see there's a confluence of at least six factors together with an environment that was really right for this sort of place, right? People were going to SMSF and droves. They were controlling their own money. So basically, like, we could capture some flows from there. Hopefully, um, I can build a following. Uh, through the internet and social media and writing articles and publishing them. So the, the, the condition was right for these sort of things. So, like I said, I got really, really lucky. Mm. That's how CE started. Hmm. So, so did you, I mean, you don't have to go into specifics, but um, did you, that, that example exercise, did it, did it work? I mean, it's still around today. Did it have the effect that you intended it to on, on your friend and your partner? Oh, yeah. It kept him encouraged. Um, he's still doing his... Uh, he's still... Uh, I mean, his, his, his accounting practice is thriving. Hmm. Even, through the, even through the COVID things. And uh, he's not comfortable. He's got his own business. He's, I said, it's better than working for somebody else. But you've got something hmm. that is your own. And it's not going to die unless you let it die. And uh, mm. your clients is gonna stick to you. It's a very sticky industry, and basically, yeah. Then you you, you just shun excess cash, uh, as, uh, excess flow into uh, uh in, into CE, and that's gonna build up your retirement for you. Um, if some of your clients that you're working for, I told him to specialize in SMSFs for the Chinese speaking industry, for the Chinese speaking demographics, because you have virtually no competition. Everyone thinks it's too hard. He says it was too hard initially. I basically say you just need to start. I say do my SMSF for me right now. Set it up, right? And after you know that, after you've done it for me, you then it's a sausage factory. You can do it for everyone else, right? Hmm. And basically, then you, uh, if the client wants an alternative, if your client or friends wants an alternative, they always have CE to look back to. If they hmm. want a low cost alternative, that's not going to rip them off, as opposed to industry funds. So, you know, that wasn't our main source of fun at the end, but, you know, that was a plan. So, mm. yeah, I think, I, think, I think we got very lucky because uh, in terms of permutation and combinations, you know that, you know, with two variables, uh, you get four, you have four different outcomes. So we have the, we have the best outcome that we can hope for, which is two businesses going well. Hmm. That's a great way to think about it. In, in a conversation we had previously, Peter, you said that, um, you said that one of the things about law uh, in general is that it tends to be narrow and deep whereas investing is kind of this it requires us to have a multidisciplinary framework 
and I feel like you've done a lot of thinking about this. Um, maybe just as taken as a whole, can you explain to us how law would be narrow and deep versus investing requiring a multidisciplinary approach? Yes. I mean, Munger has talked about Charlie Munger, which is, which is my most important mentor in my whole life. Uh, I've never spoken to him, but he's a mentor. I, he's spoken about this before. The world, the world pays for deep and narrow. And the reason why the world pays for deep and narrow is because the world has developed on the back of an exchange economy. So, and, and in an exchange economy, it pays to specialize. So, you know, I've got excess, I've got excess chickens. I'll, I'm going to trade, it, trade, trade you for your excess rice, for example. And our lives are both better off. Um, and, and, and it gets increasing, increasingly specialized. Think about it, right? None of us can ever be self-dependent, self-sufficient. You cannot be. You go off grid, right? You can't create your own building materials. You got to buy it from somebody else. You can't create your solar panels. You got to buy it from somebody else. Yeah. It, it, we are also dependent on one another because of deep and narrow. Everyone is deep and narrow, right? Mm-hmm. Even the computers that I'm using today, right? I can't create this. And I don't even have the knowledge to create this. So, you know, no one is self-sufficient. Everyone, everyone is not deep and narrow. That's what the world pays you. That's what the world pays for. Um, same with the law. It doesn't escape that. So, for example, like mm, my specialty is commercial litigation. So, in plain language, that basically just means that you know, two adult persons are unable or unwilling to resolve their business disagreements, then they, just, they, they want a third party to make a decision for them. That's basically what commercial litigation means in Chinese. Uh, in, in plain language, you know, two bickering adults, they can't, they, 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 they can't come to a, a, an agreement and they want a third party to make a decision for them. Mm. Um, and the third party that makes a decision for them, obviously the judges of the courts. Uh, the judges of the courts, they can't make a decision just based on the vibe or you know, based on uh, uh, um, based on the toss of a coin. That's a, that's a process that you've got to follow. And the process is lengthy and expensive. And everyone needs to, know, needs to follow it. And if I'm a lawyer, I need to know the process. And the process is different for every single court. It's different for every single procedure. It's different in every single state. <laughs> you need to know all of that. And quite apart from that, you need to know about the law, you know. So somebody comes to you and say that, no, I have a problem here. I've got a disagreement here. And you've got to figure out, all right, which part of the law does it apply to? Is it a property dispute? Is it a, uh, is it a, a, a contractual dispute? You know, or is it, what form, of, what form of law does it fall under? So you need to understand that. Then you need, um, is there an inheritance dispute? You know, is it a dispute with council on planning developments, for example? Then the lawyer still needs to figure out, okay, who is the person he's talking to? Is that person able to be uh, uh, to, to go to courts, to go into a court to actually start an action? So, for example, somebody that's a minor, uh, below 15 or 16, I can't remember the, the legal age, they can't sue in their own name. They're going to they're have a guardian, right? Or a company. They say, oh, there's a company. But you have to know where to search to look up details of the company. And if you find that the company is deregistered, then 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 there's a problem because a deregistered company doesn't exist under the eyes of the law. So you can't use that company to sue in court. So then you've got to resurrect the company first. So that's an example of the deep and narrows that I'm talking about, right? Uh, different courts, different jurisdictions. And that's just commercial litigation, okay? There, there's criminal litigation. There's family law. There's legal licensing. Immigration law, customs excise, international trade, taxation, corporations, MA, strata management, hmm. environment, building and construction. All of them requires deep and narrow. So, hmm. and it's not just the law. Think about the medical profession eyes, ears, nose, feet, blood, brain, bones. Every one of them needs specialization. Right? Accountants, auditors, MA, consulting, tax. Engineers, civil, chemical, you know, mining. The world pays you to be deep and narrow, and that's the reason for that. And that's what the law is. It's no different. It, you have to be deep and narrow. Um, and obviously, like business, encompass everything all across all these boundaries or pro, uh, professional boundaries. 
uh, all these specialties. So obviously, if you want to uh, invest in business, you know, need to know about businesses. And it, by definition, it can't really be deep and narrow. It has to span across all of these things. Mm. So mm. Uh, I, I think in a nutshell, that's the best explanation that I can give. But you know, I, I'm sorry if it's not clear, but um, I just think that the main takeaway is that the world pays you to be deep and narrow. But in investing, you have to go the other way. You, you said to me, um, and I've, I actually wrote down this as a quote when we spoke. You said, investing is a narrow subset of understanding life. I, thought, I found that was a very profound thing to say because on the one hand, we've got these deep and narrow professions and just general walks of life. Um, and investing itself, when we look at companies... We look at, you know, almost unlimited possibilities of what that company could become. Um, so ha- I guess there's a few things in this. One is, you know, how do we use tools to analyze uh, these mental models to analyze companies? But also, I, I think this requires you to stay humble, right, as an investor, because you simply can't know all there is to know. A couple of ways you can approach this. I preface it by saying that I've got Munger in my head because <laughs> Charlie Munger basically tries to tell people how they can possibly utilize the methods in which they can use to lead a better life. Everyone has a definition of what a better life is. There's also the question about what's the meaning of life. You know? And again, everyone has a different answer to that. And I think I think the most popular answer is 42. But <laughs> The um, if you think about business in an ex- abstract sense, think about it in a business in an abstract sense. You know, not not your not 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 your coffee shop down in the corner or something. But think of business in an abstract sense. What what is actually a business? You need to define a business. How do you define a business? What well, what is a business? Right. I mean, in, in, in a in a very abstract sense, a business is basically one or more person employing a certain methodology to produce goods and services in exchange. That's basically all a business is. Whether you're producing chickens or rice or semiconductors, all that you're doing is you're producing goods and services so that you can exchange it. All right? And the problem is that people don't think about things beyond money. People think that, oh, well, you know, Apple, they, sell, they, you know, they make all these iPhones and they sell it for money. All right? But in, in essence, the whole of civilization, what we are doing is basically we're exchanging goods and services we're, we're producing goods and services so that we can exchange it with each other. And money only came about because physical exchange of goods or services is too cumbersome. So money money is actually the oil, uh, the, the oil that reduces the friction for the exchange. That's what money is. At the end of the day, you know, money is nothing but a promise. You know, it, 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 in a way, if you, it, it, if you have... The, if you have the stomach or the political inclination to read Ayn Rand, she'll basically say that money is not the root of all evil. In fact, money is how, is what a civilized civilization is. Because in essence, when you are when you are selling your time or services for money, what what are you getting in exchange? You're getting pieces of paper, right? In essence, the pieces of paper is just a promise by everyone around you that they will give you goods and services in exchange if you give them that piece of paper. It is the biggest trust in society that. It, that has ever been engendered in order to allow civilization to progress. Mm. And in essence, that's what business is. Put aside money, that's a separate issue. You asked me about life, uh, understanding bis- investing and business as a part of life. If you understand that this is all, this is what we're doing. We're, we're producing more goods and services for each other to make our life better so that maybe we can free up a bit more time to do other things like think. For example, uh, to think to research, to be happy or to be with your children. You don't have to spend your whole day hunting mammoths and wild boars and bringing them home. You, know, you, don't, have to, you don't have to spend the whole day creating energy. You, you have other people doing it at a more energy efficient method. So that basically, we are all more efficient. We can devote more of our time to trying to figure out the human condition. What is our purpose here? Or if we know our purpose here to execute that purpose. And that is what or that's all that business does. It produces goods and services. But 
what is linked to that is what is life is all about. If you need to understand what life is, you know, you have to you have to consider how we have developed, why why we are the way we are, how we interact with each other, and where we are headed. And mm. if you look at that, the production of goods and services is just yeah, it's not insignificant, but it's just a subset of what you need to understand life. You know, why are we why are we producing goods and services for each other? Mm. Right? So you know. Uh, uh, I think in the sense that it's to do with how humans interact with one another. That That is also basically what business is, you know, producing goods and services, how a group of people interact with one another, how that group of people interact with another group of people, you know, supplier and customers, for example, uh, or supplier and government. Uh, and like I said, it can only be a subset of how you, you uh, uh, how you want to understand life. But what I'm saying is that they are not mutually exclusive pursuits. You can actually do one and be good in the other because the way I look at it is that if I try to figure out as much as possible what life is about, the investing part will fall into fall into place. So it just it's just a you know scaling knowledge. But if you look at let's say the pro- human progression and the birth of civilization, how did we progress from caveman days until here? Right? Um okay, this is what I've written down in my notes. How are goods and services produced? Is taming and trophy. By application of energy, we shape materials into configuration that don't does not that will not exist naturally. That's what humans do. We apply energy, we create something that does not exist naturally. Tools don't exist naturally. You gotta shape stones. Right? Copper wires don't exist naturally. You gotta mine the copper, smell it, and then shape it into the uh, a semiconductor chip, the natural state is sand on your beach. This is what humans do. We create patterns that are far, far from equilibrium, which is why I think the EMH got it us and backwards. All right. If you believe in the EMH, you're just trying to figure out, you know, I'm not sure whether you have children. I'm not sure. Do you have children? No. Okay. You can imagine... You talking to your dad, your dad is saying, Owen, you gotta do well in school, right? You gotta to be top of your class. Or you gotta to be top of your profession, or you gotta to be top in whatever you gotta be good in whatever you're doing. And you tell you, you you tell your parents, look, dad, it's a it's a futile endeavor. You know, according to the EMH, you know, the average result will be average. No one outperforms the average, right? So there's no point being the best. You just need to be average. Does that make sense? No, no sense whatsoever, because in a cohort of, in a population, in in whatever group, the average is by definition the average, right? But there will be outliers in every endeavor that I've been involved in, whether it's been at school or card counting or within a group of people or even within a group of investors. We know ex ante who are the top performers and who are the ones that's going to fail, and it's consistent. You know, right? Through, and this is why I call um, the insight is basically into random, what we call random processes. We say some things are random. What is random? Random basically just means that there's no pattern to it that we can discern, right? But mm. sometimes, sometimes, a system that appears random just appears random because we are ignorant of the properties that governs it. We don't know. And we don't know, we don't know where the pattern is. We don't know what to look for. We can't understand it, so we say it's random. So to cavemen, since the birth of civilization, life is random. The dinosaur can step at you any time, the lightning can strike you. It's so random. It's basically, you know, you can fall in a hole, <laughs> you know, there's flooding, there's fires. Life is random. And so life expectancies follows accordingly. <laughs> you know? But since then, life expectancies have increased. Why? You know, because we are generating order our randomness by application of knowledge. So I'll give you an example. Evertop put me on to this. So Evertop gave an example to say EMH and equilibrium. Um, in a card counting scenario where no one knows card counting, from everyone's perspective, 
the whole game is efficient. The house gets an edge. There will be winners, there will be losers, but on average, the house will win. And let's say that that and that is that is a predetermined state. Just like in an EMH, stocks will return seven or nine percent over the long run, and you just invest in the next market. That that that, that is a goal, right? And the market is efficient to that extent. So in card counting, it's efficient to that extent. There will be a big winner, but there will be many, many losers. And at the end, the casino will get that age. All right? So someone who knows card counting comes in. And he plays a game. Is the game still efficient? Maybe not. The next step is, what if he doesn't play the game? He knows card counting, but he doesn't play. Is the game still efficient? Probably. The correct answer I figure out is that whether or not the market is, whether or not some uh, a system is efficient depends on who you ask. Mm. And if so, factor by implication, it depends on the knowledge of the person. The person who knows card counting, to the person who knows card counting, from his perspective, the game is not efficient. In the sense that's defined that the house gets an age all the time. Right? But to a punter who knows who does not know card counting, the game is efficient. Hmm. So whether or not something is efficient sometimes depends on the knowledge of the participants. And this is how humans have endeavored throughout millennia, all of this time, right? Hmm. To an EMH, they'll, say, they'll tell humans, there's no point trying because like all of you will end up average. That's the way it is, right? Or you're going to die at 50 or 30 or whatever it is. There's no point striving to be 70 because yeah, some of you might live to 70 but somebody is going to die at 10 and you're going to even up, right? But no, our life expectancies keep going up. Why? Because we have knowledge. We basically know more and more and more about a system that appears random and we make it non-random. Basically, I, I, I happen to think that there are very, very few things that are random. It's just that we don't understand it and we call it random. Okay, for example, another example, a coin toss, right? What's the odds of a coin toss? 50%. Right? Your expected return is zero. If, assuming even money bets, right? Your expected mm. return is zero, correct? Mm. But what if, what if, theoretically, you, you have a capability to measure the velocity, the spin, the hardness of the material of both coin and the surface that it lands on, density of air, whatever, all, all of the physical characteristics that would determine the trajectory of the coin. What if you know all of that before the coin lands? Would you'd have a much better be chance of... Probably not. You'd have a much better chance of knowing exactly. how it's going but to land. Somebody who does not know is a 50-50 toss. But to somebody who knows, it's no longer a 50-50 toss. Correct? Mm. But it's still the same phenomena. You're still flipping a coin. It's still dropping on the ground. So how you understand efficiency depends on who you ask. Right? Application. The roulette wheel. The way they measure it is pretty simple. All you need to do is basically measure the rotation of that, 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 that whatever roulette contraption measure the speed or rotation of that little ball, you need four data points in total. How fast this thing is rotating, you, you calculate a point, and once it rotates, you calculate another point, and you can calculate how the rate at which it's slowing down, and the same with the ball. And the quick way to do it is to pinpoint, pinpoint a, a, a physical location where, 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 where the ball passes, for example, and you click, and then when it passes again, you click, and the computer then knows by exact calculation how fast it's going, how fast everything is going. And it could make a reasonably good guess as to which quadrant of the roulette wheel is going to fall into or which particular section is going to fall into. And then you put all your bets on that particular section where the numbers turn up in that particular section. Using this method, the expected return is 40% of, of, of return of capital hmm. per, uh, per dollar of bet. But, and this, is, this has been mathematically proven. To me and you, we go to the casino, we roll, 
to us is to me is efficient. The house gets an edge. Yeah, I play long enough, I'm gonna lose. To a guy who can measure the physical characteristics of the ball and the wheel, to them, that's a 40% edge. So I hope that this encourages readers to think a bit, bit more deeply, not just about investing, but about life in general. So how many times do we hear defeatists basically saying, yeah, there's no point trying anyway, it's all shits anyway, the world is going to shits, you know, it's, 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 it's bad and blah, 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 and I can't do anything, I'm insignificant. In a very, very tangible way, your acquisition of knowledge can change your life. Mm. People just don't realize that, you know, not, it doesn't happen all the time. That's not how the numbers will fall. Some will su succeed spectacularly, but some will just fail very, very dismally. But overall, there's a trajectory. And it's very, very clear. That's why we're in stocks. <laughs> right? Why are we in stocks? Why are we not in gold? Why are we not in property? Why are we not in bonds or cash? If you take raw numbers, you will see that, you know, the, the usual charts, right? I mean, like stocks has out, outperform every single other asset class. And it doesn't just outperform by a little bit. You know, the calculations is such that if you start with a dollar of each asset class, you no know, stocks will end up at 3 million something something. That's a remainder, right? <laughs> that remainder, 3 million something something. Just don't worry about that 3 million. That something something already exceeds the return of the next asset class, which is bonds. The factor, the, the overperformance factor over 200 years is nearly 3,000 times. Okay? Mm. But that's the past. How do we guarantee that that's going to happen in the future? And to do that, again, we need to understand the nature, the properties of the system we're talking about. We need to understand what, what, what is a stock, what is a share, right? It's basically just a part of it's just basically a part of a business. What is a business? A business produces goods and services. How much goods and services are we producing every year per, per unit of resources, whatever you want to count? Right? More and more and more. Will humans, what are the needs and why are goods and services produced? Because they are there to satisfy the wants and needs of human beings. Are these wants and needs going down or, get, or going up? From marketing, we basically know wants and needs are unlimited. No, needs are limited. Wants are unlimited. The only way that that's going to go down is if we have a catastrophic drop in human population. Right? If we don't have a catastrophic drop in human population, even if population stays stagnant, our requirement for a higher standard of living will virtually guarantee that we will need more and more and more goods and services produced more and more and more efficiently going into the future. That's what drives stock prices. If you accept that stocks is actually a rep representation of the production of goods and services within globally or within an industry. So, mm -hmm. you know, you can go on the figures, but if we don't understand the nature and the properties of the system we are investigating, we're just, we're just punting blind. So, you know, the reasonable thing is that, well, that's the past. How do you expect that that's going to go in the future? And you, you, as a fund manager or as an investor, you need to answer that question. Why do I think that's going to continue in the future? Just because it has continued in the past, it's not a, it's not a, um, it's not a good answer. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so in a sense, that's, that's, that's why I say um, this is about understanding life itself. You, you need to know the, you need to know what you're talking about, actually, in a nutshell. Mm. So... In application for you personally, how do you how do you structure yourself and okay. your consumption of information so that you can you can allow yourself to have these uh, kind of these stimulus that inputs into your thinking? Okay, at, at, and it's multidisciplinary and brings that in. Like a lot of people struggle to to do that, right? Okay, it's a work in progress. Um, so. My thoughts over, over the last week is that you have asked me a question of uh, 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 why it's silly to call somebody stupid. Mm. Right? And the reason is pretty, pretty simple. That we are deep and narrow, right? So just in the field of law and in the profession, so long, I've given you like at least 50 different, 40 different disciplines that you have to specialize in, right? And that's just things that I know, right? 
On top of that, there's manufacturing, planting, agriculture, space, whatever, right? The whole of human endeavor. Could we try to picture what is the extent of the body of knowledge, the, bo the body of human knowledge? How vast it is, right? Then think about how much we know. How, how much do I know? I'm relying on nearly aspect of my life on the kindness of other people producing goods and services for me. Even me talking to you today requires all of these things that's been set up by other people that are nowhere to see. I, I, I don't have any idea how to do it. There's electricity, there's computers, there's the internet, there's a hardware required. You know, there's a food that keeps me, keeps me, keeps me, keeps me full. There's water here. There's a desk here. All of these things somebody has to produce. You know, so if, if you think about how vast the human the body of human knowledge is. And the fact that each one of us only knows that much. That much. Probably, you can't, probably can't even measure it. It's probably just a sliver of the whole body of human knowledge. right? And the idea that you call somebody stupid, is the implication is that he doesn't know as much as you or he doesn't know anything. Mm. Is that stupid? I... You know a sliver of a sliver. He knows a sliver of a sliver. The difference between you two on, on the whole scale is insignificant. Mm. It's who is calling who stupid. Seriously, I mean, like, it, you know, it, it, it just makes no sense. That's one of the irrationalities of humans. We, we can't take big numbers into our head. Right? Mm. And consider this. If you want to be mind blown, consider this. The total sum of Cumulative total sum of human knowledge now. Is it complete? A lot of things we don't know. We don't know how the brain works. We don't know what consciousness is. We don't know whether there are any smaller elements and particles. We don't know whether there's dark matter, dark energy. We don't know how big the universe is. We don't know why it's expanding. We don't know a lot of stuff. And a lot of things that we thought was true, the body of knowledge has turned over. The, the rate of degradation of knowledge, somebody uh, I read somewhere, uh, I, I, can't, I, I can't for life for me remember, has been decreasing degradation of knowledge. So professionals have to upgrade their knowledge on ever, ever more increasing shorter time frames. Right? There are some fundamental things that will remain, remain the same. Right? That's why fundamental science is important. But a lot of a lot of things are starting to change as we keep discovering more and more things. So the sum total of human knowledge, which is, which is already so vast beyond comprehension, then you compare it to what we don't know yet. What don't we know yet? That there is a possibility that what we know now is also just a sliver of what we don't know yet. And for each one of us humans, what we know is a sliver of a sliver of a sliver of a vast amount. Right. Think about that. If you put that in perspective, that's a practical perspective. The same as if you look up in the sky and you go like the universe is so vast and I'm so insignificant. There's no practicality to it, but there's a practicality to actually thinking that your, your, your knowledge is insignificant. You have no knowledge whatsoever to be self-reliant. That's number one. Think about it. If ever there was an a, 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 a apocalypse or whatever, you're out on your own, there's no electricity, there's no fire, there's nothing. You need all the skills to survive. You know, even that basic survival skills you may not have. So if that doesn't encourage humbleness, then I'm sorry, you know, it, I, 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 it can't be helped, right? It can't be helped. You know, humans are born to be confident and egoistic and hopeful. You know, that's how we progress. So that's, that's also a required, that's also a required trait. But, uh, do you think? Do you think someone that's not so humble or just has much humility at all? Do you think, as an investor, that that type of personality is a ticking time bomb for their own capital? Oh, uh, for sure. Well, when you go long enough, yeah. I mean, it's just, it's just, it's just the guy with big whatever, right? You know, he's mm. he's swinging around and he's making the big trades. But the law of numbers says that eventually it has to come a cropper. So in Chinese, we have a saying, you know, if you go up into the hills often enough, eventually you meet the tiger and you'll be eaten. <laughs> take, take too many risks and eventually, yeah, 
you're gonna you're gonna go because yeah it, it, it's like what mark twain says it's not what you don't know that's going to kill you it's basically what you think you know for sure that 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 just ain't so and those those are the major traps um you can make money for a while but uh, i i just don't think the numbers stack up to it you know the old saying the market you know i i know of all investors i know of all investors but i don't know any old and poor investors <laughs> so yeah so basically that's 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 in a rambly way the way i the, the way i view things and um as you can see it's a demonstration of how you try to understand life then automatically you can understand how investing has to progress along the same way and how it's just a subset of how you understand life hmm. I, will, I will have more practical examples later on so basically i think you asked me about how we use a multidisciplinary approach um hmm. so again you know Number one is you got to know what you're doing first. You know well, what was your aim, what's your objective, right? And different people, different different managers have different objectives. So a lot of people come a cropper because they don't know what their objectives is. Yeah, uh, they don't define it properly. So my objective is to make money. Mm. So the natural question is how? Everyone wants to make money. How? How are you going to make money, right? I can rob a bank. I can sell drugs, you know, I can work my ass off in a profession or I can start my business. I can invest in stocks, right? The, the why is, the how is important. How, how are you going to do it? So how I do it, and I don't, I can't speak for how others do it, but how I do it is obviously no secret. Warren Buffett, he says the same thing. Your task, your job is to purchase part of an easily understandable business at a rational price operated by honest and capable management whose earnings are re reasonably certain to be significantly higher in the future that's 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 the task you have to buy part of a business at a, at a rational price operated by honest and capable people and the earnings of this business is reasonably you're reasonably certain it's going to be much higher in the future that's that's your task okay sounds very simple then you start breaking it down right okay what's an easily understandable business hopefully a good business easily understandable business it's probably something that's born out of experience my take on it is a bit a bit wider it links to your your other questions in terms of why why investing is an idiosyncratic behavior why uh, is an idiosyncratic endeavor you and me understand different things because we are we experience life differently we learn we have learned different things we have we, we're just different right um and what i understand may not be what you understand so for example i have a good mate uh uh who, who the approach is the same but he goes for businesses with high volumes and low margins i have another investor he likes the retail businesses the banking businesses i don't like those right I go for professional services business, usually business with slightly higher margins. Not because one is inherently better than the other, but basically because I could understand this set of businesses and I can't understand the uh, those other sets of businesses in the sense that what when I say I can't understand it, is that I I feel that a good investment for a good business, you should be able to distill after your due diligence the two or three cru crucial factors that's going to drive the business. You know, that 20% that's going to whack the 80%. If you ha haven't reached there yet, you either don't know the business well enough or the business is not, it's not, it's not of investable quality in that there are too many indeterminate factors, at least for me. Right? Maybe there are some people out there that could make it work, you know, a business that has like, you know, six different factors affecting it you know that they could actually pin all that down i mean that's that's not that's not where I, that's not where i play um and um so basically that that that's to do with understanding understanding a business how, how i understand a business is the same as how i prepare for this interview in order to answer your questions i gotta do a full complete answer and then i need to distill it back down again same thing with einstein or or or, or, or any endeavor for that for that for example where you need complete mastery over it you no know, you need to 
grasp the whole thing and then reduce and simplify it to its essence. And that's exactly what is required to, to actually come to a conclusion that you know, it's a good business. You know, mm. And I can understand it. That's important. So where, so you mentioned professional services before. Is that, so that's born out of that experience and you can capture the essence of the business because you're familiar with it. Yes. Are there, so, so, so you say that, you know, banking is probably something that another person that you know does and they invest in that. And that's too complicated because it's just, well, not too complicated, it's just too many moving parts and you can't capture that essence quickly enough. How long, like, if, if, is it possible to quantify how long it would take you typically to determine if something is not in your circle of competence? It's a very, very good question because it links to a crucial concept of what we're doing in terms of circle of competence. You know, basically don't walk around things that you don't know. So you need to know where the line is. So like what Lilu said, you need to know what you don't know in order to finally arrive at what you know. So it's a, it's a matter of elimination. You look at this stuff and you go like, do I know anything about it? So first thing is, do I know anything about it? If the answer is no, am I able to learn it quickly? If the answer is no, then that's it. Too hard basket, right? If the answer is yes, I'm able to learn it quickly. Third one is that, would I want to learn it quickly? Am I interested enough? <laughs> you know? And it comes down to things like, for, for me, gambling, um, you know, gambling stocks. Uh, tobacco stocks, you know, just, just, just things that are not, I won't call it ethical investing. I don't think it's a good business in the long run. You know, because you're not, you're delivering, you're not really delivering value to your customers. Um, so businesses that I don't, I don't really like, I don't really like to be involved in. No, I don't want to be involved in a business that will encourage a lot of people to gamble gamble away their money so that I can be richer. It's not, it's not, it's not, you know, I don't want to be in a nice, happy place. So that's a third filter in terms of, yeah, it can be a business that I can understand really, really quickly, but I'm not going to, I know a lot about gambling, but I don't invest in casino stocks. Mm. So that's the, uh, uh, that's my third filter at least. So yeah, some, number one, do I understand this? Number two, if I don't, am I capable of understanding it reasonably quickly? And number three is that could I be stuffed? <laughs> okay. So then then if you if you ask those questions, there will be a lot of no's. There'll be a lot of no's. A lot of no's, a lot of no's, a lot of no's, a lot of no's. And that's why when when we are acquiring knowledge knowledge or when we're doing studies or disciplines and stuff, it's, it actually helps if you increase your knowledge on an adjacent basis and not pick random subjects that has a, t- uh, uh, has a low probability of have, uh, linking them, right? You need to link your knowledge. You need to link your mental models and stuff like that for all of them to be useful. But if you pick things that are too far apart, yes, you might be able to make a breakthrough link, but the probability is very, very low. But I suppose that like, if you do make that link, you'll be making a huge amount of money because you know, nobody else will be able to make that link between two really, really disparate subjects. But chances are life doesn't really happen that way. So again, we look through our areas of innovation, how innovation comes about, you know. They basically, some, somebody wrote a paper on this, that did, actually did a study on this, and they basically says, yes, the adjacency is important. You can't have too much overlap, but you can't have any overlap between two disciplines where breakthrough occurs. You have to have mm. some overlap, but not too much. Not too much, there's no nothing new coming out. Too far apart, you can't link them. You need to be just at the right size. Life is about balance, as usual, the yin and yang. Um, mm. And um, when, when we do our research and when we look at companies that we could possibly be interested, interested in, in doing a lot of due diligence and deep dive, it helps if it's adjacent, but it's, it, it's reasonably different. If it's just a, say, adjacent, but reasonably different, maybe it's at a different level in the supply chain, Maybe it's on an adjacent supply chain that's going to converge. Or maybe it's to do with a new technology that, it, that, that will enhance the current technology. Something like that, right? It, if, you, if you seek your knowledge in adjacent areas, it makes your job easier. Mm-hmm. And, um, and 
and then your circle of competence uh, starts expanding. So you there'll be less and less areas where you say you don't know. There will still be a lot. There will still be a lot of no's, but you know, the number of no's will start dropping. Mm. So that, that's the way I look at it. It's a matter of elimination. Mm. How about then when it comes to identifying management? I think, I don't know if it was Munger or Buffett, maybe it was both, um, that's say something to the effect of you're looking for management with integrity and talent and equal measures of energy as well. How do you think about that in, in the context of your investing? Well, through several bitter experiences, I basically found out that you can't make a good deal with a dishonest person. <laughs> I, and no matter how good the business is, you can't make a good deal. You, you Okay, I'll phrase it another way. You won't have, I have never had a happy outcome any time there was a question about management. Never, not once. Okay. And I made a mistake recently which took away 4% of portfolio but precisely because I broke that rule. So that will be a filter from now on. And we have a, we have what we call a corporate shit list. We have a list of all the people that have done questionable things in the past, everyone that's linked to them on the board of directors, even the lawyers and the accountants that's involved. And we have a list and the list obviously keeps going longer and longer and longer every year. And make sure that, because sure as the sun will rise tomorrow, they're going to be back eventually in one form, guys or another. And uh, yeah, we try to steer clear of all all of these people. They are just wired differently. They're just totally wired differently. Or better are they all, or, Peter, are they all different to, let's say, you and I? Or are they? do they have any common traits? You know, have you distilled those, the people that make it onto that list? Maybe you've got some examples there. Okay. It's quite hard to, to, to discern dishonesty, right, from not any really. reports. Oh, you know? No. Okay. You, you, you basically have categories, right? Um, I don't know. I mean, I, uh, maybe, again, it's the idiosyncratic endeavor. The way I've grown up is such that perhaps I'm more sensitive to dishonesty than perhaps your usual uh, 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 persons, right? Maybe I'm more cynical. I don't know. But I always appear to be able to sniff dishonesty or at least questionable behavior pretty much early on from some sort of vibe if I'm meeting that person face to face. I can't define it. I've gotten into countless arguments with my wife before that this person can't be trusted, stay away, and she doesn't listen and she regretted it. It has been, um, I don't know, I think ingrained in me. So sometimes you eyeball them. You eyeball them, you ask them a question, you see how they answer, right? There's no, there's, there's no clear guide about it, right? I mean, like, okay, I've written something about it. Just give me a sec. It's to do with how you pick an honest and capable manager, which is the same as how you pick an honest and capable fund manager, how you assess, uh, how you assess honesty, right? Mm -hmm. Number one. Who do they hang around with? Crooks hang with crooks. Honest people hangs with honest people. Right? You seldom see an honest person hanging out with crooks. But right? that's yeah. the first indication, right? Um so lo look at who they congregate with, look at what they do. You no? Know? Uh, are they always on the society pages? For what reason? For example. Second the second factor is a bit more tangible that uh an honest person is reliable. They basically do what they say they're going to do. They, and they keep their promises. And the last big indicator is that they do the right thing even if the right thing is painful. Mm. I mean, you keep this in mind. I can't, you know, that I've got a brain blank at the moment. I can't really come up with examples. But my, this is true my experience, right? If I'm dealing with an honest person, uh, they're usually very reliable. They basically say, look, you know, I'll call... Uh, uh, let's have coffee soon, right? And two or three days later, they'll send you an email to basically say, "Look, when are you free for when are you free for coffee?" 
right? And usually these are the people more often than not, right? I mean, some people are ulterior motives. This is just an example, just an example. You know, it mm. doesn't say that that person is honest, but at least he says that they are reliable, right? They just don't say something and forget about, it. oh, we're going to catch up again soon and you don't see them for the next few years, right? It's just, just empty talk, correct? doesn't say that they're dishonest, but at least there's no indicator of reliability. You know, they say they're going to do something. Oh, mate, I'll send you that spreadsheet tomorrow with, uh, uh, oh, you're interested in this stock, right? Or uh, whatever, you know, ABC. I've got a spreadsheet of that. I'll send that, I'll send that material to you tomorrow, hmm. right? It's an indicator of reliability. Too many indicators of those reliability adds up to a totally unreliable person, which is really bad, right? But usually... An honest person does not display that. An honest person basically do what they say they're going to do. So from an investment, investing point of view, you basically look at what management has said and what they have done. So there are past examples. If you follow my tweet, you probably have seen it. That I keep griping about this company. It keeps moving their goalposts year after year after year. First, it's going to be cash flow positive by a certain date, then it's EBITDA positive by a certain date, then it's EBITDA run rate positive by a certain date. They're all subtly moving the goalposts. You know, as a sign of dishonesty. Mm. Yeah. Because when you don't actually point it out, it's going to be painful to say, look, we're not going to be cash flow positive, but I think we, we will be on EBITDA basis positive. Yes. You know, but you, you don't own up to your mistakes. That's a painful thing to do. A prominent fund manager, he basically nearly killed the fund that he was in during the GFC because he bought high and sold really, really, really low. And he since then, then he got booted out of that, uh, 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 of that firm. And he, his excuse was that, oh, I can't comment about it because we are doing a class action. Against the uh, against the company, but I have good reason to believe that the company liked him. Now there, there, there are two problems with that, right? Number one is that you should only be trading on public information, right? So if you're acting on some information that the public doesn't know, hmm. then that's inside trading, you know. Especially if you say that they are lying to you, how specifically will what they say impact your uh uh, uh impact I- impact your decision? It's questionable, right? And he has never owned up to that to that mistake. He, they keep trumpeting all the all the things that they that are, are they're good at, but they never own up to mistakes. I'm pretty sure you know of another figure that's in the Twitter sphere that we own, we own, we own. You pop, you know, they, they probably have like 100 stocks where they have like 0.01, you know, a 10 basis points position, and every time one of those stocks. <laughs> You no, know, comes out of good news. They say we own, right? Even though it's not going to be significant, right? You no, know, the position, even if it increases ten times, goes on ten basis points to one percent, right? It's not going to be significant. But they don't trumpet their mistakes. They only say this thing is doing well. We own this thing is doing well. We own. That is intended to deceive. There's no there's no other reason why you're going to do that consistently, other than to paint a rosier picture than what is intended. And that is that is an indicia of this to me but any issue of dishonesty, all right? And human characters are such that if they are dishonest in one little area, especially if it's a minor area, you can bet your bottom dollar that will be dishonest when it comes to the crunch. So thirdly, honest people are candid. They speak their mind. And there's very little sense of social niceties at the expense of candor. You usually get it straight from them, right? That is how it is. They tell it straight. That's a sign of honesty because honesty is also linked to intellectual honesty. Not always, but usually. So um, lastly, in terms of a fund manager, an honest manager has a keen sense of fiduciary duty. And that means that they are very well aware of the responsibility they are bearing in terms of taking care of some other people's money. In fact, for most managers, they don't look at it as money. I don't look at it as money. I basically look at it as a product of a lifetime of toy and hard work that has been entrusted to me. Right? And basically, I have to take care of it. It's precious. It's like they're delivering, not quite extreme, but delivering a fragile baby into my hands. You have a keen sense of duty that you don't want to hurt them. In fact, when it comes to a choice of whether I'm going to enrich myself or whether I'll protect their interests, it's a no-brainer. 
will, will always protect their interests first. And it is a hallmark of professions. That's why, you know, that's why, uh, I mean, like, that's why your personal experience is important. Like, you know, uh, uh, being a lawyer or being a doctor, for example, or in any sense, in, in any professional, uh, 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 in any professions, that there is a requirement of fiduciary. There's a fiduciary duty. You have to take care of your client's best interest all the time, with your exception. And uh, that's usually observed in the bridge. Human natures as they are. So it's very, very rare that people are fully, fully sort of like in full compliance of this fiduciary requirement. But yes, an honest person, usually there's a keen sense of fiduciary duty. They're just there's something bigger than themselves. Do you find, Peter, that you end up investing with founders or or, or management teams that are um, aligned with a family? Do you often think that they have some type of, they feel that duty, that sense of duty more so than other types of management teams? I used to be a strong believer in this. But I've since modified my stance. It does help in an alignment of interest. In most cases, it's not an absolute rule, right? Okay, the problem is this, right? I, I mean, like, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a useful indicator. That's as far as I'll put it. It's a useful indicator that interests are aligned. That's as far as I'll go, right? Because the interest can be misaligned elsewhere. Yeah. Hmm. But that's just one thing. It's not a be all and all. It'd be nice. It'd be nice because if you found a baby, like if you if it's your baby, the business that you have started, you there's a certain sense of pride in it, right? There's a connection to it that is above monetary gain. In a way, then we the probability is higher that that will do the right thing for the business, in terms of providing more value or 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 or, or getting get getting making the business better going to the future because it's their baby. They want to improve it. Yes, mm-hmm. uh Generally, yes, but I, I can't take it that high because the problem, once again, is that the knowledge is incomplete. I would like to see somebody write a book on all the business failures of companies that have huge insider ownership and why they fail. Right? We don't have that data. We, don't, we can't count people that are dead. We can't count the business that are dead. So whatever things that you go through in terms of your statistical mining or all these studies, you can only show all the survivors. You know, all the people that, all the companies that have done well, but you, you never told me all the people that, all the companies that haven't done well just because, uh, you know, even though they are, they are heavily owned in, uh, by insiders. So that's a mm-hmm. lacuna there. I hope somebody will do that study. Maybe it might, I might do it or I might hopefully get a, get a partner or a disciple or whatever or a mentor to do it. But yeah, it's something it's something in the future. Mm. I won't put it that high. It's not that simple. Mm. I I have experience with heavy insider ownership that prefers themselves all the way. Mm. Right? I mean the parking lot indicator is pretty useful. Oh well we 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 look after costs and we look after business and you walk you you go to their corporate headquarters and the parking lot is filled with like luxury Mercedes and Porsche. Mm. So yeah, in, in terms of honesty, yeah, there are a couple of indicators that you look at. Majority management, it would be nice to have, but it's not determinative. Mm. Right. And the nature of the business is important too. You've got a crap business, you need superlative management. Not, not only must they be honest, they've got to be capable. And capability mm. is quite another issue altogether. Yeah. How about then one of the other criteria, which is the, the reasonable um, I guess expectation that a company's earnings will be higher in the future. How, that's a that's a it's a big one. How, yeah. how, I guess just a, a a question just straight off the bat is, do you do you forecast earnings? Um, do you okay. refrain from doing that? Or this comes back to this again links to uh, your question of the mental models that's being used. Mm. You can see that investing is a link game, right? You know, it's going to be a boring word, but everything is linked to everything. So, you know, it doesn't go in sequence. One of the mental models is engineering in terms of backups and redundancies. So backups and redundancy is a recurring theme because it goes to the central concept of a margin of safety. 
backups and redundancies mm. uh, and a margin of safety. So we, we need a margin of safety just in case things go things don't go the way that we uh we want we would like them to go. And basically to figure out how how things can go wrong, let's say if you're forecasting the future or business, you're thinking that well, okay, the business might make whatever, right? You know, in the future, and uh, uh you're trying to project into the future, we then need to figure out all the possible outcomes in the future. In order to Basically, in order to figure out what can go wrong, you need to basically try to imagine different scenarios on which things can go wrong. And that basically involves you trying to figure out, you know, some people do the, you know, the, 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 the code red scenario, code green scenario, things go really, really well. If things go really, really passive, if things don't change and stay the way they are, if things just go moderately well, there are a couple of scenarios where you basically have to figure out and you also have to have a scenario where you can't figure out, you know, some 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 wild ball scenario. What you necessarily get is a range. You always get a range. Mm. For companies that you can understand, and for companies that obviously the markets like, is earnings with more certainty. So basically, earnings with more certainty basically allows you to compress the range. The range gets narrower. And uh, the margin of safety is basically buying it at that bottom of that range where even if the worst outcome scenario comes about, you don't really lose much or you lose very, very little. And that's why price is important because if you picture it as a graph and there's a range that's V-shaped, right? And the tip of this V goes up and down depending on the price. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, you can envisage that. And when, it get, when the price gets low enough, you know, you, you have an outcome where the, uh, you have a, a, a range where even if the worst case scenario happens, you don't really lose much, right? But if you tip the price up and the V-shape goes this way, it, it, there's only downside from there at, at a high enough price, right? So that's, that, that's a graphical method to think about it. But you have to figure out the range. The usual punter figures out a story and hmm. sticks to that story. Okay, and that's, that's, that's a flaw, I think. Because humans like story. And... The way we make sense of the world is through stories, to link to link events together to form a narrative that is coherent to you. But that's not how uh, that's not how reality works. Because when we form narratives, the reason why this is not this this happens is because when we look in the past, something that has happened has happened, so it's set in stone. But we forget that that something wasn't predestined destined to happen. Something else could have happened in its place, but we just didn't see it because it didn't happen. We only saw things that happened, and then we, we could construct a story from there, right? And then we try to construct, but then we use this as a way to construct stories in the future, and that's where the flaw is. Okay, the way we look at future, and the very fundamental, and this is where mental models come in. If you study physics, you will basically know that there are some uncertainties at the basic structural level of matter. Um... So, for example, Heisenberg uncertainty principle it says that you can you can you uh, you cannot you cannot determine there are two variables and they are linked and you cannot determine one uh, 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 at the expense of the other. Just read it up. I can't. I, I'm not that well versed in it. Um, there's also the duality of matter. So basically, uh, when you shoot a photon of light through uh, two slits, two narrow slits, the results that you get can only be explained if that photon of light has passed through both slits. But there's only one. How can one thing pass through two slits at the same time? Hmm. Right? So there's a, 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 a particle wave duality in terms of matter. All right? And you don't know which is which until you make the measurement, you make the observation. So the observation basically crystallizes your results. The, the very... Ne- the very fundamental nature of our existence is such that the future is unknown. Even at basic physical, the basic physics tell you that. That's why there's a multiverse and things like that. That's a basic thing that we need to understand, right? But the thing is that then we forgot all about that when we when we do all of our investing. That we forgot that the future, by definition, is indeterminate. That's why I call it future. We don't know what's going to happen. But we can try to reasonably estimate what's 
will probably happen and then we can prepare ourselves accordingly. And that's what human life is about anyway. You know, you prepare yourself, you know the snow is coming, you hunt more, then you bring your food back so that you can weather, the, you, 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 can, you, you, can, you can get past the winter. You know, that's the worst case scenario. But if winter doesn't come and it's okay, well, great, you know, that's all right. That's how we conduct ourselves, but we don't conduct ourselves that way in the market. Why? Hmm. Something to think about. So in terms of mental models, you need to know all of these future scenarios. And that requires a knowledge of probability theory. You don't know probability theory, you can't grasp that. Why, why separate? No, why there could be a range of outcomes and all of them equally that has, has, has probabilities of occurring. Another example is electrons. When I studied my chemistry or my physical chemistry 30 years ago, we were thought that there was a there was a there was a big nucleus and the electrons was like you know orbits it like a planet like a moon around a planet. That's totally totally bloody wrong, right? <laughs> because the correct the correct thing now is that there are clouds, you know, and the clouds basically represents the power the probability of where the electron could be at any single time. And you don't know where it is until you do the measurement, but the measurement marks it up. The measurement changes the reality. But you have a shape, you have a donut shape, you have you know, some weird shapes around, uh, uh, around, the, uh, around the nucleus. So just the same as Schrodinger's cat. You don't know whether the cat is there or alive in, in that chamber. You just don't know, right? And the act of measuring crystallizes the result. But before you observe or before you measure, it exists in different probability states. Okay, this, this is the foundation of risk management and how you know and how and how we train randomness. There's a book, there's a book that I can tell you about it later on. Um so if you don't know all of this, chances are it, you don't innately grab the pure fact that the future exists in several different states. And that that means that a lot of people think in terms of narratives. And you know, you're either hundred percent correct or you're hundred percent wrong. So mm. that's not that's not optimal in terms of investing. That's the way I see it. Okay. To handle probability theory, what do you need to know? You, know? you need to know aromatic, basic aromatic, and you need to know the mathematics of permutations and combinations. You know how things combine with each other because it could be like two or three factors that are changing and you need to, like I told you, like there are two variables, there are four possible outcomes. You need to know that in, innately. If you don't have that, you don't understand. You are, you are back to narratives again. Um, to extract the relevant data for the maths that you that uh, that is required in terms of aromatic or your permutation and combination and stuff, to extract the the relevant data, you need to know how to read a balance sheet. You need to know how to read a profit and loss. You need to know how to calculate the ratios, ROEs and stuff. You need to know the language of accounting. You don't know a language of accounting. Yeah, you can't you can't do this, right? Um. To understand the possible states of the future, you need to know about the ecosystem in which the business operates within and all the stakeholders and how they are incentivized. So the business don't operate alone. It sits in what I envisage as a spider web of interconnections. It's got suppliers, it's got customers, it's got governments regulating it. You know, it's got shareholders that they are demanding something from it. It's got the interest of the management, it's got the board. Right, and every single one of them have different motivation, and you know you, you can't possibly hope to traject a future if you don't understand where it operates within. You no, know, business might be going very well, but the industry might be going shits. You no, know? or, or 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 business is going very well, but the, you know the supplier is going to pull the rug from underneath it. What happened with Bitter Group and Telstra? You know that's why we don't like we try to avoid supplier concentrations. Right, mm. um, the government might uh, might put an X uh, on you. So basically, like Macmillan Shakespeare, when the governments, uh, I can't remember what it was, some political some political decisions, uh, that was going to affect the future of uh car leasing, for example, which was his main business. Um, cap charge. You know, when the government decides that they'll let Uber in, you know, there goes right. Uh, so you need to understand the stakeholders. And mm -hmm. that brings you to what Charlie Munger always talks about, basic psychological tendencies and the biases. Number one, the big significant part of it, in fact, if you don't know all 26, just know this one, just one, just one, incentives. That's all you need to know, incentives. Who gets paid what? 
incentives that's going to drive nearly 50 percent of what you do who are the players how are they incentivized that's what they're going to do whatever they are incentivized to do that will do that okay mm -hmm. so so this is how we 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 sort of like uh use the mental models we don't use them in isolation we link them all together to get a coherent picture mm. so at a basic level that's how i explain it. it is very 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 basic and there are conundrums usually charlie munger basically says here when you analyze a business you have unanswered questions or you have like weird things happening and you use all the mental models to try to explain it if you can't it's too hard no? mm. um so basically Sorry, if you ask me about some examples, right? Some tangible examples. So, okay, for example, US. US is a Malaysian. I mean, you probably heard about this company. They're based. They're basically a real uh, a holding company that's listed in Australia, but the main business is in uh, property development in Malaysia and now increasingly Vietnam. Uh, the actual structure is a bit more complicated than that, but. Just just take it as it is at the moment that US, this is a company, it has uh it, it develops property and it holds investment properties specifically, not just in Malaysia. Like when you say Malaysia, you're you're gonna stuff up your thesis. It specifically holds assets in a specific in the capital city of Malaysia in very, very desirable areas. Okay, that is vital. To understand this stock so in terms of like you're, you're really talking about in terms of sydney you know holding commercial properties in the major business hubs you know let's say we're talking about chestwood uh, uh, central perhaps Parramatta, right as opposed to talking about commercial properties in penrith and whoop whoop and toowoomba you know, that is the difference that we're talking about we're talking about top grade a locations in in the major in the major capital city of the country so you can see how, how psychological tendencies and laziness can trip us up. The moment you say mm -hmm. Malaysia, everyone switches off. Because they go, they can't understand Malaysia. Yes, of course, you can't understand Malaysia. But you can certainly understand the capital city, even if you're forced to. Right? Even if you have to take a trip there, you can understand the capital city, right? You can understand where the desirable locations are. Just go there. Right? You know, there's no slums here. Everything, everyone is dressed well. The shopping centers and you no know, luxury brands and stuff like that. You can tell, right? What's so difficult about that? Okay, so US. When we purchase US, or just before purchase, we assess. We assess the NTA again. You need accounting knowledge. You need to know how to read a balance sheet, and you need to do basic maths. The price was trading at fifty percent on net tangible assets. What was the history? It listed in nineteen eighty nine, and uh, since then it has never needed outside capital. So basically, grown from a few million dollars of or, or outside money has turned into a billion. No, at that time it wasn't a billion yet. It was like five hundred or seven hundred. Five hundred. Yeah, it was like you know it was a hundred time gains, right? Mm. Long, long history. Long, long history. Who owns it? No, oh, management and insider owns right, about seventy percent, something like that. Um, and now uh, uh, their financials you can track it. If, if you have the database over the last 30 years, if not at least at least 10 years, you can track you can track them. Where are the properties? You can look at the balance sheet and basically like they identify where the properties are. And you can just basically like take that list, fly to KL and basically just take a Uber to go from one location to another to just verify the properties exist in the first place, right? Mm. So, okay, we bought it at 50% NTA. Over the last, always hit a, uh, uh, always entire life prior to we, to us buying it, the NTA was always increasing at ten percent. It was a very, very simple investment for me. It was again basic maths. If you buy a dollar for fifty cents and that dollar increases by ten percent, your portion of your capital is increasing by twenty percent. Right, and this thing, all I want, all that I need to do, all that I, I, I mean, the the maintenance is really simple. I open the annual report, I look at the NTA. If it's up ten percent. On a currency adjusted basis, that's done. I close it again because I can see there are other things. So obviously, it's unlevered and stuff like that. But the, the total addressable market is obviously way, 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 way ahead. Uh, you no, know, it's huge. Right? There's no issue about it growing ten percent a year. <laughs> you know, mm. it, it's not like a giant already and like growing ten percent. It's, it's, it's a baby and like growing ten percent is it 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 it. it, it 
passes the pop test. You know, there are some that don't pass the pop test. Right? Oh, these companies grow at 100% for the next 10 years. But then when you do 100% for the next 10 years, then you go at year 10. Hold on. This is, this is how many zeros are there in this, right? It doesn't make sense anymore, right? Okay. Um, so in terms of probability analysis, there are multiple scenarios that, uh, that, that you can envisage with a company like this, right? Um, we bought our shares at 50% to NTA. How do we make money? Right. And corollary, how does, how do things go wrong? Right. Which comes later, but how, how we envisage a scenario where we can make money. Number one, if the price goes back to NTA, we made our money. Correct? Okay. If that doesn't happen, if the balance sheet assets gets revalued, so the additional kick to this was that when we look at the NTA, I was quite convinced that there's a lot of uh, unlock, uh, value that's not showing in the balance sheet because they were holding a lot of land at historical cost. And there, were, there, 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 there are some balance sheet things that's going on like that. For example, they have two buildings. Again, you need to know language of uh, uh, accounting to understand this. There are two buildings that are identical, exactly identical, and one sold for seven hundred million dollars. The other one is on the books at one hundred million. And the mm -hmm. reason why it's on the books at hundred million was because the head office is there, and from an accounting point of view, you can classify that as plant property and equipment, which can be, which is being held at cost. But the real value of where they're sitting on is 600 million of uh, Malaysian ringgit that is not showing on the balance sheet, which on current exchange rate is $200 million Australian. And in the context of a company that's worth a billion dollars now or a billion point something dollars, that's a significant chunk for just one building. Mm. You know, their own land banks, which at current transactional prices is basically a 10 to 20 times what they purchase it for, but they still hold it at the purchase price, right? So if all of these assets get revalued or released in some way, even if you are still trading at 50% NTA, they're still going to go up, right? Because your NTA is going up. Even if you keep at 50%, it's, you're still going to make your money. Okay. If this doesn't happen, the company goes on, doing their own business, they increase NTA by 10% every year, notional NTA on the balance sheet by 10% every year. Well, if the 50% is kept, I'm growing at 20% a year. Right? If the company stops everything and decides to sell everything off, you know, in a fire sale, the net asset value will have to drop by at least 50% for us to start losing money. Right? Okay, then you dimension. Okay. What's, what things can go wrong? What can go wrong? All right, what can go wrong here? Okay, the assets are not there. We can verify that. The assets are not priced correctly. We can verify that. <laughs> Number three, the assets drop in value because of some economic whatever happening, right? Okay, then you figure out that you go, at, well, this is in a capital city, in a desirable area. If there's a property soon, this will be the last soon, right? And chances then you look at history as to where the commercial property in desirable central capital city locations ever drop 50 percent what's the occurrence so then you can dimension that right uh there's another one uh there's another uh, uh possibility of loss if the malaysian ringgit just drops and drops and drops and the australian dollar just goes up and up and up and up then basically you're just losing money in terms of currency but you know in the history of cross currency pairs, right? You know, there are very, very few countries that do that, but they are like in Zimbabwe and some basket cases. But generally, over 10 years' time frame, the ups and downs will even themselves. Last risk nationalization. The government goes crazy and decides to nationalize everything. Okay, fine. You know, that's probably why there's a 50% discount. Mm. So, this is the way we dimension an investment. So as opposed to a normal, usual retail uh, or inexperienced uh, investor, what they'll do is they'll sit there and they'll say, Malaysia, growing country, growing middle class, more commercial buildings, more commerce, US will make pro more profits in the future because build property will be in demand. That will be the narrative. For example, mm. right? Or the narrative would be that, oh well, I'm buying at fifty percent NTA. 
it's, it's sort of like a cigar butt play or something like that. It's, it's sort of like a narrative one-dimensional play. The reason why you dimension all of these things is that then the second part of making money comes into play, portfolio management. It's not just a stock pay. It's not just what you pick because the records, records that uh, I'll talk about later on basically shows that even for managers that makes a lot, a lot of money, their strike rate is usually less than 50%. It's not, it's not the stock picking skill. Yes, it's important, but not every stock that you pick works out. In fact, less than half of the stocks that I pay will work out. It's what you do when you're losing and what you do when you're winning, when you win that matters. So when you dimension all these things and things start happening and start confirming your business, you can actually consider adding more to the position. Or you can start tri trimming if things are not working out your way. And you have a more nuanced feel of how the position is going. If if some things occur that are 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 are, are that is, if, if one of your risks is founded, let's say the government is making noise that they're gonna nationalize whatever, right? Something like that, or a Malaysian ring it, 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 it looks like it's gonna fall because whatever, war is coming or China is coming or whatever, right? You can basically you know uh, 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 minimize your loss by basically selling out the position when your thesis don't work rather than waiting for it to go all the way to zero. Right? So the idea is that. You, you want to cut, you want to, your losses to be as small as possible and you want your winnings to be very big. So you don't sell the winners when things are working out, you know, like I did Commonwealth Bank, 13 bucks. You don't do that. You basically let the business grow as it should, right? And then you start trimming if the position gets too big. And in that way, you make sure that when you win, you win big. And you make sure that when you lose, you don't lose that much. And overall, that's how you compound money. Mm. So in a nutshell, that's how we apply that's why the mental models are important because it actually impacts how you invest. Not just in picking stocks, but in portfolio management, which is totally, totally neglected in every single investor podcast that I've ever heard up to now. Mm. Sorry. Well, you've, long you've, 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 you've bridged that very well with that example, Peter. Just understanding probabilistically as best you can, creating um those models in your, your own mind or in spreadsheet and understanding i guess the like i said the probabilities but also the impact of those if those probabilities if it turns out that you underweighted those or you overrated them and then how that informs your portfolio construction and i guess that leads on then to you know your discipline around holding companies as well um i'm conscious there's something else i wanted to talk to you about which is something that you mentioned on um, the, the phone call that I had with you, which was that, and this comes back to the a personal finance thing. So I hope this segue is okay. But it was, you said that investors need income, otherwise they take unnecessary risk. That I, I thought that was an interesting one. And it would, I think it would be relatable for a lot of our listeners because I speak to a lot of private investors, Peter, and for some people, the idea of being a private investor without a full-time income is frightening. And for others, it sounds like the, the dream. What they've always wanted to do is to manage their own money, not have the boss looking over your shoulder, etc. But you seem to think that maybe not having that income can actually afflict your investing. Okay. Very, very good question. Um, okay, before I start answering this, please do remind me that I have another example. Uh, uh, in terms of applying mental models because uh, I think you mentioned to me that the listeners will appre actually appreciate how we apply all of these things rather than just basically, mm. you know, pie in the sky concepts, right? How, how, how it's actually put into action. So I'll come to that later. That, and that, that, that I think is entertaining. But to answer okay. this question, investors need income. Again, and you ask, does this apply to private investors? And things like that. I say, I think it applies to everyone. The first concept is that you cannot serve two masters at the same time. Capital is a scarce resource. You don't have an unlimited amount of them. No one has an unlimited amount of capital. And in terms of capital, there are two choices. There's only two choices in this classical economics. You either invest or you spend. You consume or you invest. There's no middle ground. Mm. There's no hybrid consume invest. You know, 
which is what the fashion industry is trying to tell you, right? No, buy this Rolex or buy this fancy jacket is an investment for your future. That's bullshit. <laughs> That's a consumption, right? You either invest or you consume. And they are diametrically opposite. They are binary options. You don't have a choice. You have to make, no, you don't have a choice to choose both. You have to choose one. When you spend, your capital is no longer available for compounding. And when you invest, your capital is no longer available for spending. If you get that clear in everyone's head, there are two, there are two choices. You can only choose one for your capital. So which one would it be? Right? Well, so think, well, I mean, this is something for investors to think about. If you want to strike out on your own, do I have enough capital, reasonably certain, to give myself an income? So can... The, the the answer in effect is that can I peel off the capital bit by bit by bit and still have enough? And mm. obviously, uh, that depends on a lot of things. That depends on what your expected rate of return is. And I do rather suggest that you don't get too optimistic about it because you know when your pro- when expectations are not met and things get desperate, humans as they are tends to take risks in the face of desperation and loss. There's a reason for that. It's not irrational. Is totally, totally rational. All right. Mm. So the basic psychological studies basically say that, well, okay, um, if I give you a choice of taking a hundred for sure or doing a toss, 50-50 toss for 200 or nothing, you will take the hundred for sure. Right. Mm. Even though the toss also comes out with the same result on an expected basis. Right. Conversely, if I give you a, if I give you a, a, a a choice of whether you, you're going to lose $100 straight away or you take a toss. You might lose 200 or you might lose nothing. People tend to take the toss, even though there's no difference between, the, between both of them. And there is no logical reason why people will consistently choose a 100% sure gain, but will consistently choose a toss-up for a greater loss as opposed to a certain loss. All right. So that, that is a conundrum, right? That that you think is irrational, right? It's totally, totally irrational. Mm. Think about evolution, right? Our rational thoughts, right? The way the way we are uh, we are set up as human beings has already been predetermined by all our ancestors through natural selection. You know, because like uh, if you are not suitable for the environment, then the stuff you can't pass on your genes, and that's it, that's the end, right? What we have today is all the things that has been shown to work in our environment over millennia. Right, this natural selection that well, you can't beat that. Just put jump that in, in everyone's head. You can't beat that. That's what we are. We cannot beat that. Right? So our natural selection has somehow caused us to make this decision, which we say is irrational. Is it irrational? If it's irrational, it wouldn't we wouldn't have survived till today. So why so? Right? Mm. And somebody very smart has come up with a very, very simple explanation. It's to do with human survival, right? Take a certain gain, right? And if every time you meet, you have a situation and you take a certain gain and there are no losses, you are guaranteed to be ahead, right? Take a pun, you may get 200, but you may end up with zero. And you end up with zero, chances are you don't pass on your genes. Right, so it's to do with let's say, if I catch, the the example given was very smart. I caught a deer, right? The caveman caught a deer, and all of a sudden one day he saw a wolf. He's not quite sure what the wolf would do, right? If I walk away, would it attack me, or should I just give the deer to it and make sure that I'm safe? I've never seen a wolf before. I don't know what's well. I don't know what it's going to do. I don't know whether it's going to come again in the future. It's exactly the same as the coin toss, isn't it? Humans throughout millennia has come to understand that if you take a cert, if you take a guaranteed loss every single time and, and on a species like white level, if everyone does that all the time, extinction is guaranteed. Correct? Mm. If everyone takes the certain gain all the time, the possibility of extension is vastly reduced as opposed to everyone taking a toss 
then 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 probably half the half the population will perish and the other half will remain right it's not good for it's not good for survival if half the population goes down because of a systematic choice right but you no know, the the loss part is the more important one we we are instinctively wired to know that if we take a certain loss consistently all of us will die right but if we take a chance if we take a chance nine out nine out of ten of us may die but one will survive and that one will carry our genes forward mm-hmm. does that make sense mm-hmm. so that is why that is why we are wired by nature to take risks when we are desperate, when we are facing losses. Comes six back to your investor thing, needing income. You know, oh, my plan is going not going according to plan, and market my portfolio is down fifty percent at the rate that I'm going now with my needs. I'm gonna run out of money in five years, two years, whatever, right? What are you gonna do? You're gonna take the coin toss, right? You know, market is looking like it's going to go down. You know, with all the stocks that I'm holding, what are you going to do? You're going to take a risk. You're going to make a bet. Oh, nothing bad. What's the worst that can happen? I'm going to die in two years or five years. I might as well make the bet now and get it over and done with, right? Mm-hmm. And then I take the risk. So you can't, you can't, you can't fight your inherent self, but you have to understand your inherent self in order to manage yourself. So again, it's all linked back to. Why understanding life and investing is such a it's just a small set of understanding life. This is a concrete example, and how the multidisciplinary approach helps you. In this case, we understand about probabilities. We understand about human evolution, adaptation, and survival, uh, 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 selection of genes and things like that. In order to understand why, simply that you can't escape the fact that you always take a risk when you are facing a near loss situation, when you are facing a losing situation. Right, and if you know that, the wisest thing to do is not to put yourself in that situation to make sure that you never ever ever get there. And that's inversion by Charlie Munger, basically. Like, tell me where I'm gonna die. I'm not gonna go there, right? And I can virtually assure you that I'm not gonna die because if I'm never there, I'm not gonna die, right? It's the same thing. You know, you know that if you get yourself into this position, chances are you be fucking yourself up. Sorry, you probably need to edit that. Chances are you're gonna be messing it up. So don't. Put yourself into that position. Simple as that. So I, I, I'll be. It, it's a new thought. It's very, very recent. It came right on time to answer this question. Um, I don't vouch for how accurate it is, but that's how I see it, based on what I learned up to now. Okay, don't do it. Don't be reliant on income. Desperately, you no. Know, just, just basically, like you know that. That is base. That is capital. I don't need to touch it. I don't need to touch it. Then it can compound because you are interrupting compounding if you are starting to draw income from it. Mm. No, unless you are talking about hundred mil, then you don't even need to ask a question. Yeah, it's a fascinating way to answer that question. You see, uh, at present, in terms of if you are asking me about my present situation, well, all that I can answer is that at the moment my expenditure is modest. We will you know, and we have alternative sources of income to fund that. So you know, passive. Pa- I mean, we have an investment property. It's rolling back rent and things like that, and that that's enough. Like you know, we don't live a lavish life. We don't have a mortgage, so we keep our expenditure low, and that's enough to keep us happy. And basically, uh, if I'm forced, if I'm forced to liquidate everything now, at current market prices, and basically just invest and live on that, um, I would say that. I have about ten years to twenty years of runway before the money runs out. Hmm. That's not good enough because I'm fifty-one. My wife is younger than me. Life expectancies, I think, eighty or eighty-seven for male and female respectively. So I'm ten years short of life expectancy, and there's no margin of safety. Remember the redundancy. <laughs> no margin of safety, so yeah. not going to be possible. Not now, right? Not especially if. Uh, in terms of again fiduciary duty, my family and my wife, they're dependent on me making a correct correct decision, right? Mm. 
So the impact is that I've got to continue doing the law and doing other things that I really dislike doing, but I have to do it. I have to do it even though I dislike doing it. And um, I'm not saying that I'm honest, but I'm just saying that you should look for this in a hallmark of an honest person. that They have to do the things that they dislike doing if they have to be done. Mm. So mm. I hope that answers the question. It's, it's rather short. Yeah. No, it does. It absolutely does. So you you said you had one more one more example before. Um, oh, yes. Okay. In terms of how we apply mental models and how we analyze stocks, mm. right? You know, Data Tree was a, a relatively simple example. I think readers, uh, I think listeners should be should be able to get on top of, right? So at its as very basic essence, you understand that uh, Data Tree provides basically they are the computer guys that set, used to be the computer guys that sets up your computer networks in your office. So basically, I, I want five computers linked to a printer and with internet access, right? So mm. the computer guys that come in, they buy your computers for you, they set up, they configure everything, put in your password, set up the printers and toners and stuff. All right, good. You're good to go, right? Okay. That's a computer network. So that's essentially what they do, but obviously, it's a bit more complicated, right? It's real life. So they have to, they have to set. Uh, but but that's, that's the genesis of it, is IT. IT services. IT services at the time was basically setting up computers, loading your software, you know, <laughs> coming to troubleshoot when some when your printer is not working, something like that, right? Very, very basic. So everyone can understand that, correct? Hmm. In our modern age, obviously, it's not that simple. So several years ago, if you look at the time when Data Tree, well, Data Tree when it listed, up to the time when it ran into some trouble, has already turned back. It has already went up 10 times, right? It floated at a couple of million dollars, I think in 1986 or 1989, I can't remember. So it's got a long operating history. That's important. It's got a long operating history in an, in an industry that is constantly, constantly changing. Mm. So the DNA of adapting to change, you can assume is actually in the company. And that's vital for analyzing this, uh, uh, this business. But in a nutshell, the business basically consults and sets up IT networks. But they do it on a big scale for government departments, councils, some big mm-hmm. corporations, things like that, right? There are some minor businesses here there that they bought. They're not relevant at the moment for, for our purposes. So Data Tree's share price was in a lot of in a lot of uh, strife several years ago. If you look at the chart, you know exactly when. Right? The low was 58. And that's because revenues was revenues went down everything went down i think they cut the dividend the basic narrative was basically saying it expenditure is going to get smashed it's going to remain low for a while that's the best story the bull story was basically like it expenditure will bounce back and you know they're going to do well again. that's a that's a basic simple if you want you won't go on hot copper that's the narrative right and if you want a variant perception you're going to do better than that <laughs> So basically, okay, I spoke to several IT guys that I'm fortunate to be friends with. Next door to me at that time was a credit union, very, very small credit union, and I, I like, I like, uh, uh, I got talking to the CIO. The guy was in charge of all the computers, and I spoke to him and regularly. And at that stage, I asked him, "Hey, can I ask you, uh, 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 uh how often do you guys change your computers?" Oh, we change it every three years. Um, and uh, it's time for change now. And uh, and I'm in a whole lot of headache. And I said, why? Well, I don't know yet what to do because we can either change all of our system and keep what we have, which is like, you know, the usual isolated private network. Or I could start moving things to the cloud where apparently it's faster and cheaper and simpler. But... At the moment, it doesn't look like it's very reliable. Data may be lost. You know, you know that we are credit union, we are customer data and stuff like that. I don't know, I don't know whether we should. You know, the data is now now resides in a secure private server. But you know, you want me to put it in a data center? You know, what's the what's what? The situation was unclear, right? So that's why I'm talking about timing in business. For businesses, timing is very very important, right? You got to be in the right time at the right place before something can happen. If you're not the right time, nothing will happen. And nothing was happening at that time. And apparently it wasn't just him having that problem. It's everyone else having the same problem, right? What am I going to do? 
Am I going to go to the cloud? Am I going to use Dollar Center? Am I going to retain legacy? What am I going to do? I've got the money. I don't know what to do with it. I don't want to make a mistake and lose my jobs. Lose my job. And that's, that was the whole IT industry. And you can straight away understand straight away why there was a different role in spending. Right? More important than that, you know exactly what is going to trigger it and you know what to look for. Right? So the industry will resolve itself. Right? Somebody will take the lead, others will follow, and you will, know, you will see a trend. And that trend will go on for a long, long, long time because it's been decided until the next disruption comes along. So either everyone is going to go to the cloud, and at that time, the cloud will be whether it's a, is it public cloud. Would public cloud be preferred or private cloud? At that time, Data Tree already had private, private cloud. They spent a lot of money doing private cloud. So they got that trend wrong. But at least they got on the right path because then they converted everything to public cloud. Because eventually it turned out that public cloud was the preference, despite all, all expectations, right? And if you look at the mechanics of the cloud, just understand a bit about IT, you can understand why it is so much better. Because if you have ever managed a computer network before, you know that for IT guys, it's just like they'll laugh their head off, they'll be banging their heads, right? Because like humans make really, really stupid mistakes with computers. But apart from that, right, every time there's a software upgrade, you need to take the stupid disk, you need to go to every single computer to upgrade every single hard drive, right? And you know, in the organization of 1,000 computers, mm. <laughs> that takes a little bit of time and then you're gonna troubleshoot it, then you're gonna train people how to use it, right? Um, with cloud, it's very simple. With cloud and uh, SAS, the, up, the update happens in the cloud, in the data center. When this goes in or the, uh, the module goes in or whatever goes in, it gets changed, and then it's just piped down the line to 1,000 terminals. Everything is updated straight away. Mm. Right? Cheaper, faster, more efficient, more options, more choices. I mean, it's cheaper. Number two is that the IT guys don't have to spend their time doing stupid things and they could spend their time doing doing more productive things, you know, instead of like going going to somebody's computer trying to debug their software and things like that, you know, one thousand times, you know, something happens with the software, you gotta do it one thousand times. I mean it's a no brainer that it's easy, it's cheap, right? And because you're in the cloud, it allows for remote. So you know, no, no, any blind Freddy could see that you know, remote computing was actually going to be uh, 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 going to be important because look at the number of people on their smartphones. I don't know the number of people on their laptops, right? You need remote access, you know, and remote access is simpler if you have a cloud rather than having to actually get back into your server again. <laughs> mm. So some some very very basic knowledge of IT which everyone would have, right? I'm a lawyer and I know about this. I'm not even a computer nerd, right? So you know that it's gonna to move to the cloud. So okay, the natural nuts and bolts of data tree. If you look at the if you look at the uh, 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 data tree properly, you will see that they break their uh, uh, revenue component into two components, services and hardware. And basically the total addressable market, you can find that out in Australia, it was at that time 80 million and growing at five to 7%. You can virtually, assume that data IT spend will increase because if IT spend goes backwards, we've got a lot of things to worry about in Australia, right? Because that is the nature of a uh, developed country that is developing, that you need more and more and more IT infrastructure because your communication flows needs to be more fluid in order to advance. And that is clearly where we are headed. If that's going backwards, then the rest of the economy is going to be doing really, really badly. So you can virtually be, be sure of a high probability that the total addressable market is going up and it's not going to collapse. And it was at about 18 billion at that time. Dollar Tree's revenue at the time was slightly less than 1 billion. Granted, not the whole addressable market belongs to them. Some are in like big, huge, super duper enterprise and things like that. But the addressable market from last mention is roughly about 40 billion. Long way to go, right? Um, the, the revenues are divided into hardware and service. And the secret sauce is the hardware makes 9% gross margins, the services make 38% gross margins. Wages are 11% of revenue. So you can understand that for every hardware that they sell at 
they have to pay their staff 11%, they're losing 2% for every piece of hardware that they sell. But for mm-hmm. every piece of services that they deliver, they're making 38%, less 11%, they're making yeah, close to nearly 20% margin, mm-hmm. right? So you've got two components. And what are the services? What are the hardware? Not that difficult to decipher, right? Hardware is hardware, your peripherals and stuff and whatever. And I project, I actually projected that to stay flat, but my IT guys, my IT friends came back to me and said, Peter, you got rocks in your head. Hardware is guaranteed to go up. I said, well, price deflation. Number, number of units might go up, price might come down. Well, it could be, but pretty reasonably certain that that's going to be overwhelmed by hardware going up. Okay. Number two, services, is it going to go up or is it going to go down? We don't know, but two wearables, four outcomes. The worst case scenario, hardware and services go down. That means either total IT spend is going down or they are stuffing up somewhere. Right? That's a worst case, worst case scenario. How likely is that? I mean, how li- how, that is unlikely because if, then you have to understand psychology. right? I set up a network in my office here, let's say, for example, a government department sets up a network, who has all the passwords, who has all the detailed knowledge of the architecture of the system is the incumbent. It is very, very difficult to displace the incumbent because that is the guy that you work with who has intimate knowledge of all this stuff that you know, you don't really want to bother with. So the chances of them being involved in any replacement cycle is very high. And the replacement cycle is like for the hardware is every three years, pop, 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 it, gets, it gets replaced, right? There's troubleshooting, there's data centers, there's add-ons and stuff. Also, networks are getting compressively, uh, po- increasingly complex. You can't just go to your corner store and get that bloke to come up and do a, a data center cloud security thing or he doesn't have the skills you need so you can go hire a computer guy a data guy or a security guy and basically manage a four or five contractors and get them to work together to somehow try to fix your network which is mission critical or you can go to one guy data trade and say i've got this problem can you, can you come and fix it and how many organizations have all the required skills to actually address this problem very very few your mom and pop shops can't compete, right? And where do IT guys want to work? You know what? IT guys don't want to work for your up and coming, expiring, uh, uh, aspiring corner shop, right? Where you know customer has a problem, but he's only good with data. There's no security guy, so you can't get the contract, right? You want to work with the top chip corporation, so you know the brains matter. Mm. So in terms of their business going down. That there's the incumbency and the switching cost and the complexity, the chances of that coming down is very, very, very low. Even if it comes down, you can see it. It's not going to come down like a cliff. It's just, it, it, it might come down gradually if they're stuffing up really, really badly and you can see it in advance. Chances are you won't. The probability is pretty low. So the worst case scenario, both services and uh, 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 hardware coming down to erode to erode future earnings, that's very low, but you can dimension that. Okay, then there's other two possibilities, services going up, hardware going down, or hardware going up, services coming down, right? And you can sort of dimension it because you know the margins, okay? And you can see that in a good scenario and a bad scenario, in a reasonable scenario, you can see that even if hardware stays stagnant and services goes up, because services has 38% margins, your gross margin, your, your, your net margins will start increasing, right? Um, if in a happy coincidence that both starts going up and they stop losing money on hardware, then obviously like no margins will go through the roof. You can actually do do this on roughly on a spreadsheet. You can see where it's going to go, right? And you can basically reasonably pan in some expected rate of growth for this company. Now, then when we bought it, it was uh, trading at roughly about a seven percent dividend, which is gross up is a ten percent. It was roughly the relevant metric that was important was profit before tax because they pay out 90 percent of a fully frank dividend so the 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 the, the 90 percent of net profit from a fully frank dividend you no know, grows up the most the, the the most accurate measure is your your EBIT. so basically you can picture that they're paying 90 percent of their habit because you get your franking credits back right so you track earning earnings profit before tax 
and profit before tax metrics was uh, I think at that time it was 150 times a dollar 20. It was trading 180 million and it was uh 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 the the PVT was heading to 20. So we're trading at a multiple of less than nine times the relevant the relevant metric and going and growing projected to grow uh, projected to grow. So yeah. So this was how we dimensioned data trade. And obviously the thesis played out. But this is where it got complicated. When we got in, we had to wait three years because the price went sideways for three years. Every year that we were in, the earnings and dividends kept going up. And uh, then for some reason, the market tweaked on in 2019. The price went up five times in a matter of six months or something like that. So it's now trading at... Uh, 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 from a market valuation of below 200 mil, it's now trading at a market valuation of over 750 mil or something like that, or, or 900 mil, depending on. So that's one practical example of how we dimension, how how, how we analyze a, a, a company like the other trade. There are obviously other details involved like management and, and mm. things like that. You know, the way we look at management was basically that are, 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 is more of how, how they manage the people that's working underneath them. You just need to be convinced that the, the culture and DNA within the company is still the same as it was in that they'll keep adapting to change, mm. which is a constant in the industry. And you need that change because then you need the, you need the IT guys to come in and troubleshoot. If there's no changes, there's no need for them, then it gets commoditized. Mm. So there, there, there are other factors at work, but you know, in a nutshell, this was how this was one practical example of how we uh, we did our work on data tree. So at the end of the day, same thing. We made a mistake. We sold too early, too fast. So that was a portfolio management thing. We we got a three bagger out of it. We should have gotten a five six bagger out of it if mm. we had managed it correctly. Because the latest figures basically showed that their public cloud computing area has gone from like sub 30 million revenue to approaching half a billion dollars worth of revenue about three or four years right and yes that that has low low margins they don't break it out separately but even if you assume that it's the same as product margins that's nine percent but the critical part is that this nine percent has no associated wage cost or other costs mm. associated with it so it just flows all the way to the bottom right and the evidence is in the wage to revenue ratio the wage to revenue ratio has started dropping steadily over the last four or five years from 11 to 10.5 to 10. It's now sitting at roughly nine, it's going to eight. So, you mm -hmm. know, that, 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 that is basically how we know that the thesis is playing out. They are, they are, they are getting the, the, the wages component is going down and they're capturing all the margins. Mm -hmm. So, what's the future like? So, I mean, the, the reason why we saw it basically because like, it was trading at roughly a valuation of. It, it was a valuation that implies roughly about 30% growth at the EBIT line for a uh, compounded every year for the next 10 years. I think that would be difficult to achieve. Not not totally impossible, but you know, they need to grow that line by 30% every year to justify the current price. It's, a, it's another fantastic example. Totally different industry, but knowing the, the range of outcomes, so powerful. Peter, there's... One more question um, that, and you mentioned, you know, uh, mistake there was selling too early. Um, one question that I always ask is, what do you wish that you knew earlier or sooner about investing? Like if you could go back in time and give yourself when you just started, maybe when you're buying CBA shares, what would be something that you would tell your younger self about investing? Is there anything in particular that you would say? Oh, would say that I wish I had taken Charlie Smunger's teachings much more seriously and adopted him as a mentor right from inception. Mm. And I recommend this to everyone, right? These are the tools within Charlie Munger's teachings are the tools that you can use to be the best of what you could be. That need not be an, in investing. It can be in anything that you choose to pursue in life. Within that but obviously, if you want to do investing, that's good because like, you know, they're also into that. But it's applicable much better than them. There's very, very little down downside to this exercise. The upside is tremendous. You know, like I said, not just in financial terms, but being able to live a rich, 
a richer and more fulfilling life much much earlier on than everyone else you know, that is the single advice that i'll give to myself if i was younger you should have taken charlie munger seriously and adopted him as a mentor seriously right then and then how would how would you do so just practically would you read you obviously got the buffett's letters but then how would you did you just go to omaha or would you listen to watch the the videos of them answering questions like how would you absorb that information no uh, you you will have to read poor charlie almanac there are two, only mm. two books on charlie manga poor charlie almanac and the other one is uh damn right it's called damn right mm. uh, it's written by somebody else but it's about charlie manga too damn right and um yeah damn right and poor charlie almanac it will be tough at the start it will be tough at the start because you don't have the uh, you probably don't have the ex- the young investor probably don't have the experience probably don't have the practical experience probably don't have the requisite knowledge to actually fully integrate it mm. but if you bear with it and you keep going and you keep going or uh, you know five years six years i think you are uh, virtually guaranteed that he or she will be reaching a much more fuller richer and fulfilling life if you do that mm. that is the single best advice that i can give don't don't bloody listen to buffet just look at what he does right <laughs> buffet is one of the best investors of all time but he's got a shocking family life he's got an absolutely shocking family life i i don't want to be him right he made it a mission to be the richest man in the world from a very very young age that was his mission to be the richest man in the world he achieved it but at what price mm. if, if you want to follow an example it's not buffet you unless you are willing to come to terms with what you are willing to give up in exchange for what you want but with manga you you can be you can fulfill your life purpose using the methodology that is taught you you got to figure out your own way but the way to do it has been set up that 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 would have been exactly what i have needed to be done much much earlier on 20 years ago at least 30 years ago probably hopeful i can't wish that they've introduced me not to buffet and lynch but to poor charlie and name just give me that book mm. I, I i i would have been i i guarantee i would i may not have been richer but i would have been a much happier person much much happier person by doing this conversation peter You've given, hopefully, many, many thousands of people the opportunity to learn some of those uh, tools and, and learn from your experience and your examples. But then also ending it this way with this conversation and, and what you would do is so illuminating for those younger people, particularly that are listening, that may be getting started investing or in their profession. Um, mm. you've, you've heard it right here, folks. There's two books here that you should pick up right away. Um, and I'll put links in the show notes. Peter, there is one one other thing that just a quick one. Um, this is the first longer form interview that you've done. If people want to find out more about you and Castle Ray or just uh, keep up to date with what you're doing, how would they do that? You can follow my uh, you can follow my uh, nonsense tweets on Twitter. That's uh, <laughs> that's at Pan Lawyers. I operate a law firm called Pan Lawyers, which is my similar name with lawyers at the back with an S. So at Pan Lawyers, that's that's where my Twitter is. You can look for me in, uh, on LinkedIn. I've got Peter Pan, and that sets out my curriculum. I don't use it that much, but you know, there's some basic information there that I'm not just a fictitious, you know, character created by AI. Um, <laughs> there's also the website, obviously, uh, and that's just for information purposes only, and it's castlerayequity.com.au. So Kasore is spelled as in like Kasore Street in, um, in Sydney. Yeah. Uh, and that was how we came out with the name because my office is on Kasore Street. So I named my I named the fund Kasore Equity. I'm I'm original. I, I I'm really. really <laughs> well, it says it on the tin. It makes sense. <laughs> yeah, so it's kasoreequity.com.au, and yeah, we got we got we got every single memorandum published on uh, on uh, 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 on that site since inception. So there's seven years worth of them more than enough to put everyone to sleep um 
I mean, if you if, if just if 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 you don't mind, I mean, like, I I can complete some of your questions really really quickly too because sure. I think some of them are important. You ask me, stop picking is in the tails, but EMH followers aim for the center. It's aiming for the center. Good. Yeah. So basically, essentially, it takes with what I talk about in terms of uh, recommending Charlie Munger, but you may not necessarily go into investing. You can go into some other form of your life purpose. In Japanese, it's called ikigai. If you find your AK guy, you're gonna be a really, really happy person, right? Mm. And uh, 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 it may not be, it may not, you may not be a billionaire or a millionaire, but you'll be happy. So, but having said that, my answer to the aiming for the center is that aiming for the center means getting market returns by buying index funds. That's all. There are, that's all there is to it. There's good and bad. It is good because not every person can be an investor. Not every person can be a plumber. Not every person can be a doctor. I don't know why everyone profet, uh, 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 spouts this idea that everyone can be an investor. No, not everyone can be an investor and not everyone should be. I think the world is better off if we have more doctors, scientists, teachers and engineers, you know, spending their time doing what they love rather than distracting themselves, moving bits and bits, moving bits and bits and pieces of paper around, which is, you know, this investing caper. Index investing is also is good for uh, 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 the average person who doesn't want to specialize in investing and doesn't have the time to do so. But it is bad because it's being done to an excess. And just like candy and ice cream, too much of a good thing for this particular thing is no good for everyone because there's not too much money in index funds. And that means that when there's too much money in, that, in index funds, the index funds becomes the market. Bear in mind the index funds. What was the index funds were set up so that they can mimic the performance of the market. That was what it was originally intended to do. But you've got a situation now where the index funds are the market. So you got to think about it, right? Like use the stock market. Uh, the, something has got to be used according to what is intended. If you don't use it for what is intended, then you're gonna stuff it up. Like you sit on the arms of a sofa, you're gonna stuff up the sofa. Right, stock market. Use the stock market for gambling. You're gonna stuff up the stock market. Use the stock market for what is intended, not for gambling, but for raising capital and supporting companies. <laughs> um, so basically, the flow of index funds are creating asset price bubbles because there's a positive cycle feedback. You can read more about that in uh, uh on the blog why there's a positive cycle that's happening, and the positive cycle is basically overwhelming the normal price setting mechanisms of the market. The bubble gets big, big enough, it doesn't just hurt the speculators, it hurts everyone. It results in failures, it results in unemployment, it results in systemic risk to the system. So it's not good. So, you no. Know, basically, that, 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 that's my word on stock picking, indexing, and, uh, uh, and EMH. Mm. It's not, it's not going to end well. Um, why does the community never work? Again, I say, oh, yeah. Owen, you're cheating. Because you are basically asking me a question that Charlie Munger has asked and basically left unanswered. So the tentative answers is this. By ev- Firstly, by definition, the average of any group is the average. That's by definition. The average of any group is the average, right? Okay. You may have a higher average if you have a group of top performers. Your average will be higher, but you will just get the average, a higher average. You will get a group of low performers, you will get an average too, but you'll be a lower average. Getting average means that you're not going to get the best, but you're not going to get the worst. If the group is large enough, your average becomes market performance, after which you pay fees for the privilege. So you might as well buy an index fund. Hmm. Okay. Secondly, why does the committee never work? Because we touch upon this, it's not the strike rate that matters. Picking the correct stocks is only half of half of the equation. Nobody gets it right 100%. The best portfolio managers, 50-50. It's portfolio management that is also, that's the other half of the equation that's going to make you money, right? The idea of the portfolio management is that you size your positions, you execute or you sell. You, the, the whole idea is that you try to get away from the left side of the fat tail where the big losses are, and you try as much as possible to get a chance to get into the right tail where all the big momentous gains are. And you do that systematically so that you always have chips to stay in the game, 
right? And you have to do that, manage share for every single position. How do you get a committee to do that? Impossible. Mm. Committee can't, a committee can't do this, all right? So that's my answer. Why, why, a, com- ha, ha, uh, why, why a committee would, wouldn't work? Mm. I think must a manager have operational or working life experience or is being a professional analyst straight from university good enough? So basically you're asking me, when you're choosing fund managers, do they need to have business experience or mm. can, they, can they just be a straight graduate uh, you know, from within the system you know, and then they're out in the world? So the essence of it is whether business experience is important for a fund manager. So again, I said, I don't have a definite answer because I have no data on this. No one has any done any studies on this. I don't know, right? Again, my preference is to have a manager with some experience of running a business, but it can cut both ways. The experience, the knowledge by experience and knowledge from book learning, they are different things. You might think they're the same. They're totally, totally different. There are studies that shows that knowledge from experience, especially traumatic experience, they get embedded into different parts of your nervous system, into your autonomous nervous system. Knowledge by book learning just get embedded into the into your brain. It doesn't go into your autonomous nervous system. Why I say that in the early nineteen twenty in the early nineteen hundreds, a French doctor did an experiment, and basically the French doctor had a patient who has brain damage. The brain damage was such that. The, the patient has no short-term memory. She'll forget anything that happens five minutes beforehand. And the doctor, what happens is that the doctor sees the patient every day and the doctor has to introduce himself to the patient every day and they shake hands by doing that, when they, when they do that. One day, the doctor planted an electrical wire into his, into his palm and he shook hands with the, uh, uh, with the patient and, then, and that delivered an electric shock to the patient. The next day, when the doctor offered his hand again to the patient, the patient hesitated as if worried that something bad is going to happen. By all clinical accounts, the patient should have forgotten about the electric shock. Hmm. But somehow she remembered why. The, the implication, the theory is that the traumatic experience was seared into some sort of, sub, uh, some sort of sub, subconscious autonomous uh, uh, level of a nervous system. And this, the takeaway is this, knowledge from experience is important because it's embedded into yourself. Knowledge from book learning can only be knowledge from book learning. Whether it's good or bad depends on what knowledge you have acquired from the experience because some people have traumatic experience embedded in them that prevents them from doing the rational things. All right? So you want managers who have had the right, correct experience. You don't want managers with the wrong experience because they're going to systematically stuff it up. So like I said, there's no, there's no black or white answer. It depends. Yeah, I like it. Great anecdote as well. Uh, so there you go. That's fantastic, Peter. Honestly, this you 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 you're gonna have a fun time trying to edit this because like so <laughs> much to it. But well, yeah, I think we could just put this episode out and then just call it a year because they covered so much ground and it was you answered the questions really really well. You took well, the time. So it's so much context. Like, like I said, you you did a fantastic job distilling just. A random conversation from a guy you've never met before and you've never spoken to, probably don't know where, and you've just basically extracted the essence of what I said and put them into really intelligent questions that tested me, right? I gain as much as hopefully you do from this because it gels a lot of knowledge together. But there's, there's going to be uh, paradoxes. There's going to be uh, contradictions. I guarantee you that if you just go through a material, it's not going to be complete. And I don't think by its nature it can be. That's mm. not what life is about. Look, you cannot have a complete life. Otherwise, there's no point in living life. It's always incomplete. There's always something that is going to be uncovered. That's, that's part of the fun, isn't it? Thanks for listening to the Australian Investors Podcast, which is proudly supported by JP Morgan Asset Management. JP Morgan Asset Management provides opportunities to strengthen and diversify investment portfolios through alternative income strategies with the JP Morgan 
Equity Premium Income ETF, or ASX JEPI, J-E-P-I, currently the world's largest active ETF with assets under management of US $25.49 billion as at the 16th of May, 2023. For more information, you can visit the JP Morgan Asset Management website by visiting am.jpmorgan.com slash au. That's am.jpmorgan.com slash au.